right? Yeah, it should. It's already on there. نحمده ونستعينه ونستغفره ونعوذ بالله من شرور أنفسنا وسيئات أعمالنا من يهده الله فلا مضل له ومن يضلل فلا هادي له وأشهد أن لا إله إلا الله وحده لا شريك له وأشهد أن محمدا عبده ورسوله والصفيه وخليل أرسله الله بالهدى ودين الحق ليظهره على دين كله وكفى بالله شهيدا before I begin, I'll start with the dua that was made by Imam Ahmed rahimahullah ta'ala. It was mentioned uh, by Ibn Kathir in his Bidayah wa Nihaya. Imam Ahmed rahimahullah ta'ala said, Allahumma man kana min hadihi al-umma ala ghayri al-haq wa huwa yadhunu annahu ala al-haq faruddahu ila al-haq li yakuna min ahli al-haq. Imam Ahmed rahimahullah ta'ala he said, O oh Allah, Allahumma, man kana min hadihi al-umma, whoever from this umma of Muslims, ala ghayri al-haq, who was not on the truth, wa huwa yadhunu annahu ala al-haq, and he thinks that he is on the truth, faruddahu ila al-haq, for then return him to the truth, li yakuna min ahl al-haq, so that he will be from amongst the people of truth. And I say that to myself first and foremost. That dua is for me. As I begin uh, this journey, long overdue discussion that we're going to have tonight. Um, in the words of George Orwell, very famous author, he said, if liberty means anything at all, it means the right to tell people what they don't want to hear. The common people still vaguely subscribe to that doctrine and act on it. Recently, uh, a number of statements have been made by individuals who obviously uh, were not aware of the social implications and ramifications of their words. And unfortunately, they are going to own those words tonight. The scholars, they say, أَنَّ الْكَرِمَ قَبْلَ أَن تَخْرُجْ تَمْلِكُهَا وَإِذَا خَرَجَتْ تَمْلِكُكَ Before the word leaves your mouth, you are in control of it. Once the word leaves your mouth, it controls you. Meaning, once the word leaves your mouth, you have no control over how it is going to affect people and how it is going to come back and impact you. Nonetheless, um, in tonight's lecture, unlike I have been in the past, uh, I'm going to be very blunt um, in my address by calling out names and organizations and businesses, you know, who of individuals who utter some of these words. So there will be no ambiguity after I'm done. There will be no subliminals. I'm not going to throw any shade. I'm not going to throw any subliminal shots. I'm going to call names out. I'm going to call organizations out by name. So after this lecture is done, nobody will walk away and say, well, he wasn't talking about me. He wasn't talking about me. He, he didn't say anybody's name. Nah, I'm not going to do that tonight. And there will, be no little, there will be no wiggle room for people to speculate later on about who I was referring to. So if you have soft skin tonight, you might want to hear this third person. You might not want to hear it directly. You might want to wait until somebody brings the information to you. As the Prophet ﷺ said, فَلْيُبَلِّغْ الشَّاهِدْ مِنْكُمْ الْغَائِبْ Let those of you who are present inform those who are not present. Individual man by the name of Wahid Alam. Wahid 
Alam. If I said that name, you, most of you probably don't know who I'm referring to. Wahid Alam is none other than the infamous Abu Khadija, founder or creator, CEO, scholar of Salafi publications. He referred to me as a racist, Moses, Mark Richardson, Musa Richardson, who referred to comments made by Muhammad Mufti Munir as a racist, Mustafa George, who on an audio recording referred to my dawah as nationalistic because I retweeted something that Farrakhan said years ago, uh, or comments that I made about Musa Richardson speaking or writing about the Nation of Islam as well as referring to Tahir as a nationalist because he gave a lecture to the Nation of Islam and was praised by Farrakhan and therefore he needed to free himself from Farrakhan. Where in the world are they getting these principles? I have no idea. When is it that you give the Nation of Islam dawah, calling them to pure Islam, and Farrakhan, the leader of the Nation of Islam, praises you for how good of a talk you gave. And then when you come back home to your Muslim community, you got to free yourself from Farrakhan for praising you in order to be embraced and accepted by the Salafis. So as you can see, this is yet another attempt of Salafi publications and company. And when I say Salafi publications and company, let me explain to you who the company is. The company is everyone that endorses them. Everyone that endorses them from Anwar Wright, Abdul Wali Nelson, Hamza Abdul Razak from amongst the African American flunky Salafis here in the United States, who would much rather push the agenda of Salafi publications instead of the agenda of the people that they are supposed to be servicing. The people that look like them, the people who come from the same communities they come from, people who come from the same slums that they come from, and you would much rather push the agenda of somebody hundreds of thousands of miles away in another country who don't care nothing about the slums where you come from, and you would rather push their agenda than the agenda of your people. Salafi Publications and Company. So this is another smokescreen attempt to keep you, the brothers and sisters, the public, the masses, to keep you in oblivion and in utter confusion about what their real agenda is. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in the Quran about the hypocrites, and this is not me calling them hypocrites, this is me taking the generality of the verse and applying it to their situation. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said about the hypocrites, إِنَّ بُيُوتُنَا عَوْرَةً وَمَا هِيَ بِعَوْرَةً إِي يُرِيدُونَ إِلَّا فِرَارًا that the hypocrites, they didn't want to fight, so they said, we left our doors open in our houses. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said, their doors are not open, they just want to run away from the battlefield. This is a smoke screen, and this is what they do. They baffle you with nonsense. You can't beat them with facts, you baffle them with nonsense. And that's exactly what has been done to our communities for the past 20 years. Umar Johnson, he said that the enemy of progress is confusion. And when you don't know what to do, guess what? You do nothing. The enemy of progress is confusion. And when you don't know what to do, you do nothing. And that is exactly what has happened in the African American Muslim so-called Salafi communities for the past 20 years. From 1998 to almost 2018, we haven't established anything. Nothing. We've been too busy, baffled with the confusion of this machine. And inshallah ta'ala, before the night is over, you'll be clear about what their agenda is. You'll be clear about what the agenda is. Many, especially the African American Muslim communities, have practiced Islam for the past 20 years in fear. In fear. Afraid to say that you listen to this imam or that imam. I have brothers who came to me personally told me they listened to me in private 
although they are amongst Salafis and they're amongst these hardcore Salafis, they listen to other Imams in private. And you guys know what I'm talking about because you do it. You go back, you listen to Mufti in private. You listen to Shadid Muhammad in private. You listen to this person in private. You're in fear. Someone comes to you, what's your opinion about this person? And you got to say what is politically correct in fear that you are going to be the next person being warned against. I know the lay people do it because the imams and students of knowledge do it. So I know the lay people do it. I know they do it. You practice Islam in fear and in utter confusion. Simply because the leadership in our communities, unfortunately, have not been clear about the real agenda of Salafi publications and company and their brand of Salafism that they have projected on the people. And if you didn't understand their agenda before, or you were unclear about their agenda before, then let me make it crystal, crystal clear for you tonight. It's been 20 years of the same dysfunction in our communities. And that being the case, we should want to know or have some idea of what their real agenda is. I mean, has anyone actually sat down, sat down and actually thought about what is the real end goal for these people here? What is the end goal? Because from 1998 to 2000, almost 2018, we're a couple of months away from 2018 and it's been the same rhetoric for 20 years. And you have to at some point sit down and say to yourself, what is the end goal? What is the end goal? You rotate between three to five Salafi masjids in your area. So you're only giving dawah to each other. You're not giving dawah to the kuffar. You're not giving dawah to deviant Muslims. You're only talking to each other. Preaching to the same choir for 20 years. You've been giving lectures at Germantown Masjid for 20 years. And nothing has changed. Nothing. So let me go back a little bit in order to go forward. During my interview on the night shift, I said that Musa Richardson, Moses Richardson, um, a Caucasian convert to Islam, I said that he wrote a refutation against the nation of Islam, but why didn't he write something about white supremacy and police brutality? I also mentioned that Caucasian converts tend to concentrate on issues that are directly related to the African-American experience. And what I should have said in more specific terms is that some Caucasian converts to Islam who obviously have no social, social or cultural relevance to their own community or to any particular community within the, Afri within the American Muslim diaspora they tend to funk, they t and they have no real interest in matters that empower anyone except the hegemony who they, you know, they advocate for. They have no real interest in empowering African American communities, but yet you find a lot of them uh, come to African American communities and, you know, just only enhance the dysfunction and, you know, further marginalize African American communities. They have no real interest, they don't serve any interest in our communities. Nonetheless, they don't empower African-American communities, but instead they continue to perpetuate African-American community dysfunction by furthering the narrative of the ruling class, the hegemony. And I'll talk a little bit more about that. Pay attention to what's happening here. So many of them, Caucasian converts to Islam, those who jump into the field of da'wah and focus all of their attention on African-American communities, if you notice. Anytime an African, uh, a Caucasian convert gains a little bit of knowledge about Islam, and I'll be more specific with Musa Richardson and Umar Quinn, who recently re was removed from Masjid Rahma, whether he was fired or he resigned, whatever the case it may be, many people don't know. I just found out myself that he's no longer the Imam of Masjid Rahma. All right, many of these brothers, and, and to be honest with you, I advocated for Umar Quinn. Much of his career is due to my advocacy of him. I didn't know at the time. I'm just trying to advocate for him as well as Abu Yusuf Khalifa. Neither one of them were no one to be listened to or to be heard from back in 2005, 2006, if you remember. And at Masjid Rahma's conference, I advocated for them. Nobody else. 
I advocated for you. If you remember, you were nobody. Facts. Facts. You, Omar Quinn, as well as Abu Yusuf Khalifa, you were nobodies in the Salafi community. Nobodies. I advocated for you. I told the brothers at Masjid Rahma conference to benefit from these brothers. They're not necessarily students of knowledge of, you know, the caliber of the graduates from the Islamic University, but they're people that you can benefit from. Simply because I saw that they had some iqbal, that they were, you know, moving in that direction and they wanted, and you know, and there's enough to go around. There's no need to monopolize the da'wah when you have so many other people that can be of benefit to the community. I personally don't, I'm not advocating for myself. I advocate for everybody else. Nonetheless, many of them, many of these Salafi Caucasian converts to Islam, they build their notoriety and their oratory repertoires off the backs of African American dysfunction, off the backs of African American pain, while affecting no real change in their communities. Omar Quinn was at Masjid Rah was the Imam of Masjid Rahma in North New Jersey. How much change did he affect in that community? Please tell me. Please tell me. So they build their repertoire, they build their notoriety off of the backs of African American dysfunction and African American pain. Um, and they don't realize that a lot of our dysfunction as African American communities, a lot of our dysfunction, a lot of our pain is only symptomatic. It's a symptom of issues that are rooted in the culture that these Caucasian converts come from. Most of our dysfunction as African American Muslim communities, most of our dysfunction and our pain is symptomatic. It's a symptom of the root causes that emerge that come from the cultures that they came from. And when they embrace Islam and come into our communities, they never address our issues and they never address the issues that are the root causes of our dysfunction. Pay attention. And yet they would much rather address the symptoms with no intention of helping us solve our problems, um, with no real interest in helping us solve our problems without addressing the root causes of those symptoms. And this is opposite the approach of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Opposite the approach of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam who emerged with the religion of Islam, with the da'wah of Tawheed amid a caste system, amid a caste system of racism and social, social marginal, marginalization and disparity and he tackled the root causes of their dysfunction head on. He never turned a blind eye to that. For the cause of the disadvantage and the underprivileged represents in every nation and every time the ultimate test of valor for the bold individual who chooses to champion it. Meaning, in layman's terms, in every nation and in every period in time, there is always a disenfranchised, marginalized, underprivileged group of people. And everybody stays away from championing their issues, except the bold person who stands up to say, I'm going to give voice to the voiceless, instead of continuing the power of the powerful. You understand? When Abu, uh, when Abu Bakr who became the Khalifa, he said, He said, the strong amongst you are weak in my eyes. Meaning the elite from amongst you, the rich, the wealthy, the rich from amongst you are weak in my eyes until I take the haq of zakat from you and give it to the poor. You understand? This is real leadership. Real leadership represents the poor, the underprivileged, the disenfranchised, the marginalized. They don't come into Islam and champion the cause of the powerful, the power of the powerful, the word, the speech of the elite. And that's exactly what they represent. Because look at our communities. We haven't progressed any. We haven't moved forward any. None. Which means that our issues are not being championed. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala directed the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam on more than one occasion during the early part of his mission to be on par with the mission 
of those who preceded him from the prophets and messengers. And that is to give voice to the voiceless and not to placate the feelings of or placate the feelings or further the agenda of the elite. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentions in the Quran and Surah Al-An'am. Listen to this ayah very quickly. All right, because people will say, oh, he said this, this, this. But you never mention the ayah that I quoted. Wallah al I have never given you a concept from the beginning of my career as a da'i, as a student of knowledge, as a leader in the Islamic community. I have never given you a concept except that I have given you Dalil to back it up, ever. I have never given a concept. I have never opened my mouth, even as it relates to the Sahaba differing in Aqidah. That was not my statement. That was the statement of Shaykh al-Islam ibn Taymiyyah. But then we'll run with Shadid Muhammad says the Sahaba differ in Aqidah. MashaAllah. And many of us, we bit into that. We drank the Kool-Aid. I never gave you any Dalil. No word has ever come out my mouth except that I followed it up with an ayah from the Quran or a hadith from the Prophet Sallallahu or a statement from one of the Salaf. Never. While Abu Khadija can give khutbah, give lectures, and very seldom do they mention any ayats from the Qur'an, any hadith from the Prophet ﷺ, it's almost like we become Sufis. That when you reach a certain level amongst them, they no longer, they're exempt from quoting ayats and hadith. And the same thing applies to the scholars that they endorse and whom endorse, endorse them. Nonetheless, that's the double standard that they play with. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said to the Prophet sallallahu wasallam, and I'm going to recite the ayat in Arabic, right? I'm going to recite the ayat in Arabic to tell you, to show you that Salafis are people who give precedent to the book of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Salafis are not the type of people who give khutbahs on the mimbar and then get off the mimbar and ask somebody else to lead the salat because you can't recite the Quran, Abu Khadija. Because you can't recite Qur'an. Because you don't know the rules of tajweed. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in the Qur'an, أَعُوذُ بِاللَّهِ مِنَ الشَّيْطَانِ الرَّجِيمِ وَلَا تَطْرُدِ الَّذِينَ يَدْعُونَ رَبَّهُمْ بِالْغَدَاتِ وَالْعَشِيِّ يُرِيدُونَ وَجْهَمْ ما عليك من حسابهم من شيء وما من حسابك عليهم من شيء فتتردهم فتكون من الظالمين. Allah subhanahu wa taala told the Prophet صلى الله عليه وسلم and don't chase away those who call on their Lord day and night. يُرِيدُونَ وَجْهَا Only desiring the face of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. مَا عَلَيْكَ مِنْ حِسَابِهِمْ مِنْ شَيْءٍ You have nothing to do with their account, and they have nothing to do with your account. فَتَدْرُودَهُمْ So that you chase them away. And if you do so, فَتَكُونَ مِنَ الظَّالِمِينَ Then you will be amongst those who are oppressive. This ayah, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala talked to the Prophet sallallahu directly. Why was this ayat was revealed? There is what is called asbab al nuzul reasons for why verses were revealed. The reason why this verse was revealed, because some of the chiefs of Quraysh, they came to the Prophet wasallam and they said, Ya Muhammad, Ya Muhammad, utrut an kahaula, get these people away from you. And who they were referring to was Salman al farisi was Suhaib al-Rumi, Bilal ibn Abi Rabah al-Habashi, and Khabab ibn Arat. All disenfranchised, what did they all have in common? What did all of these Sahaba have in common? Suhaib al-Rumi, Salman al-Farisi, Suhaib al-Rumi from Rome, Salman al-Farisi from Persia, uh, Bilal ibn Abi Rabah from Ethiopia, Khabab ibn Arat, what did all of these companions have in common? They were not Arabs. They were not Arabs. And they were minorities in the community. And the chiefs of Quraysh came to the Prophet ﷺ and they said, if you want us to follow you, then you got to get these low lowlifes away from you. And Allah admonished the Prophet ﷺ, don't chase them away. Only thing they desire is the face of Allah, day and night. 
Don't chase them away. And if you do, then you will be from amongst those who are oppressive. So understand that the elite in any society is always going to try to co-op the mission of those who are innocent and unaware of their global universal agenda. The elite always have an agenda. And the agenda of the elite is to ignore the issues of the minority. You understand? The agenda of the elite is to ignore the issues of the minority. They don't count. They don't matter. And I'm going to make a connection here so we understand. When has Salafi publications, when has any of these flunky followers like uh, Anwar Wrong, Anwar Wrong, that's your new name. Nothing right about you. We pray that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala make you right. But as of right now, there's nothing about you right. Anwar Wrong, Hamza Abdul Razak who dwell in these African-American communities and say nothing about the issues that are related to them. Nothing. Nothing, not a word. When the issue of, you know, uh, boycott and American products or Israeli products came up in the community, what do they do? They run back to Saudi scholars, Sheikh Obeid and company, and they give them fatwa saying, do not boycott Israeli com uh, companies. MashaAllah, tabarakallah. MashaAllah. Don't boycott American products. MashaAllah. The agenda of the elite, of the hegemony, is to ignore the issues of the minority. They told the Prophet Sallallahu if you want us to follow you, you got to get these people out of the way. Ignore their issues. They're nobodies. And this is similar. Let me make a connection here. This is similar to what happened when President Barack Obama came into office. When he came into office, all African Americans were hopeful that he was going to advocate for our issues. Don't you know that more African Americans were murdered in the streets of America during the President Barack Obama administration than in any other presidency? never advocated for anything related to African Americans. Instead, his agenda, or the agenda of the hegemony which he served, was to push forward the issue of feminism. He empowered women, white women. Right? Empowered white women. He empowered the LGBTIQ community. And he empowered laws for immigration, policies for immigration. Black issues? Ah! Push them to the side. Not important. For the entire eight years he was the president, not once did he advocate for his own people. Because, what did I say? That the agenda of the hegemony, the agenda of the elite, is to dismiss and ignore the issues of the minority. Is that point driven home? Do you guys follow me? I gave you the concept. I gave you an ayah from the Qur'an, I gave you a situation during the time of the Prophet wasallam, and I made a cultural reference to our modern time. Alright. So continuing. The African American Islamic community is ignored as well. Because of the hegemony of the Islamic community. The Islamic community the, to the Salafis is what is going on in Saudi Arabia and the Arab countries, right? So this is what happens. So instead of talking about issues that are related to our communities and the African American communities, right, that would help empower African American Muslims, right, we are fed narrations about what this sheikh said about another sheikh, what this sheikh said about another sheikh. This is what we are fed. And this is what we are told to come back to America and push on our people, meaning our issues don't matter. I told you on my interview on the night shift when I went to go visit Sheikh Qurabiyah, what is the first thing he said to me? He said, what's your position on Abu Hassan and Ma'arabi? I said, I don't know Abu Hassan and Ma'arabi. I've never heard any of his lectures. I've never read any of his books. If he was standing right in front of me, I wouldn't know who he was. He's a non-factor in the African-American communities that I come from. He said, when you go back to America, 
You have to warn against Abu Hassan al Ma'rabi. I said, with all due respect, Shaykh, I'm not going to warn against Abu Hassan al Ma'rabi. With all due respect, I'm not going to warn against him. Why? Because issues that are related to my community don't matter. What matters is him warning his campaign against this other sheikh and many other sheikhs that he has warned against. And that is, you know, forced upon us as students of knowledge, I left my family. All of my family are kuffar. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala guide them to Islam. All of my family are kuffar. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala hand selected me and my cousin from amongst my family, took us out of the gutter of the hood, selected us. Pulled us out of our family. I got an opportunity to go study. And now I'm going to come back and push the agenda of this sheikh and that sheikh. Instead of the agenda of the people that I emerged from. And what religion is that ever acceptable? When is that ever okay? And then you don't have a right to object. It's almost like the mafia. You don't have a right to say no. Right? Because if you say no... As he told me, either you warn against Abu Hassan al-Ma'rabi or I'm going to warn against you. Sheikh Muhammad bin Hadi, he said, either you warn against Medina.com or I'm going to warn against you. This is, this is the way scholars who are supposed to be nurturing students of knowledge, minorities, not only are just we students of knowledge, we are African-American students of knowledge that are coming back to our predominantly non-Muslim environment. And you are forcing upon us to push your agenda instead of the agenda of our people. You follow me? Even the brothers from Masjid Rahmah, around 2006, they came to make Umrah. And we went to visit Sheikh Muhammad bin Hadi. And me, myself, Tarheer was there, and you can verify with him. He asked the brothers, he said, where are all the white Muslims? This is what the Sheikh said. Where are all the white Muslims? Turned around and said, what? Where are all the white Muslims? He said, it seems like you guys are giving da'wah to each other. African Americans are only concentrating on African Americans. Why shouldn't we? Because when the white converts come to Islam, they concentrate on black people too. They don't go back to their communities and call their communities to Islam. Omar Quinn, did you go back to your Caucasian community where you emerged from that has given you the, 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 the platform of privilege that you so enjoy? Did you go back to them and give them da'wah? You spend all of your time concentrating on African-American communities, which you never have any interest on empowering them, educating them, really educating them on how to pull themselves up out of the condition that they're in. Musa Richardson, you wrote a refutation on the nation of Islam. The nation of Islam is a byproduct of the white supremacist society that you came from. But you will write a refutation on the nation of Islam and you say nothing about white supremacy. You understand? To dismiss the issues of the minority. We don't matter. <laughs> we should create a, a hashtag, Black Muslim Lives Matter. Because <laughs> we don't matter in the Islamic community. We don't matter. So you would tell me as a sheikh, to go back to America and start a campaign warning against this particular shape. And I guarantee you, had I done that, I probably would have gotten some of the same endorsements that Salafi Publications got. If I would have came back to America, because the Sheikh also told me to warn against Zahid, right? Which I didn't, even though I have my own personal issues with him. But I didn't. And I know that if Shadid Muhammad was on the other end, I would have been thrown under the bus. But that's the difference between a man and a coward. I can stand on my own two feet. Sheikh said, go back and warn against Zahid al-Rashid, who used to be the main person running this particular masjid that I'm in right now. I said, no. I said, I consider Zahid to be a Salafi. He said, Zahid is a follower of Tarheer. Follower of Tarheer? Zahid is a student of knowledge just like Tarheer was. He said, Tarheer is one of the followers of Abu Hassan al Ma'rabi. I'm like, oh my gosh. Where in the world are you getting this information from? You know where he's getting the information from? Salafi publications. They're going back feeding him this information. How else is he getting the information? <laughs> you, you follow me? So now I got to go back to America and I got to push 
this particular Sheikh agenda and that particular Sheikh agenda. And had I done that, I probably would have been the Abu Khadija of America calling back Sheikh. I gave a khutbah about Abu Hassan al Ma'arabi. Sheikh, I just wrote an article about Abu Hassan al Ma'arabi. MashaAllah, our Abna, our children from America, MashaAllah. And then I translate it and put it out. See what the Sheikh said about me? You see how that works? That's the blueprint. I'm giving you the blueprint of how they get the endorsements that they get. You push my agenda, I'll push your agenda. Anyway, the Prophet ﷺ, from the beginning of his agenda, from the beginning of his mission, he confronted the remnants of the pre-Islamic system of racism and classism by first acknowledging its existence. You can't ignore the obvious. As the scholars say, Ma'rifatu al-illa nisful ilaj. Acknowledging the disease is half of your cure. You can't just act like these things don't exist. They exist. So the Prophet Sallallahu he had first acknowledged it is its existence. On the other hand, we ignore the existence of racism in our communities. We ignore it. We ignore it. And, and we further perpetuate our own marginalization as a community, many times with the same leaders who are supposed to represent us and champion our narrative. So we have African-American Muslims, right? African-American converts to Islam who go overseas and study, and then come back and busy the people with refutations and warnings about other people that we have no clue who in the world you're talking about. Because you are pushing the agenda of a sheikh who told you to push that agenda. So you come home and you're writing all these refutations about Abu Hassan and Ma'rabi and Fulan and Fulan and Fulan, and we, we, have, we have no idea who in the world these people are. And unfortunately, our African-American Muslim imams, da'i, students of knowledge, right? They fall, they, they fall right in line. They're supposed to be champion in our issues. They're supposed to be champion our issues. But instead, our issues get pushed to the side. And this is exactly what, uh, and you know, the ignorance, you know, of the, uh, on the part of the African-American Salafis, they are very apolitical. They want nothing to do with politics. They're anti-social. They don't want nothing to do with other people, right? How in the world are you supposed to spread Islam? And then when you go back to Saudi Arabia, the sheikh, the first thing the sheikhs ask you is what? Kafir da'wah fil gharab. How's the da'wah in America? How's the da'wah in the West? And then we say, MashaAllah, the da'wah's muntashira, ya sheikh. The da'wah's spreading, sheikh. You're lying. The da'wah's not spreading. You're lying. Spreading where? <laughs> Where's the dollar spreading? Please tell me. Where's the dollar spreading? Sheikh asked you, because he don't know what's going on in America, obviously. So he said, keep the dollar for America. How's the dawa in America? And we say, MashaAllah, dawa tayyiba ya sheikh, a dawa muntashira ya sheikh. The, the dawa's going well, sheikh. The dawa's spreading. Spreading where? Please tell me. Because maybe I am astray, so I need education. Please tell me where the da'wah of Salafiyah, the da'wah of Tawheed is spreading. Please. What da'wah are we doing? We go from one Salafi masjid to the next Salafi masjid, preaching to the same choir for 20 years. And the da'wah is spreading. MashaAllah, tabarakallah. So instead of taking, you know, apolitical, anti-social, and they wouldn't even know where to begin to service our communities. Theirs is the case as mentioned by Carter G. Woodson. I want you to pay attention to this. Because they accused me of quoting disbelievers, right? But then I just went on minhaj.com, which is another affiliate of Salafi publications. They, they monopolize all of the... All, all, let me give you the whole blueprint. Most of these sites are ran by the same people. <laughs> Minhaj.com, the straight path.com, Salafi publications.com, this.com, this.com. They all ran by the same person. It's like the Gap, Old Navy, all of them is ran owned by the same company. <laughs> it's like they took a page out of their book, right? They're all ran by the same company. So they put a post up. Oh, Shadid Muhammad called uh, uh, Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam an alpha male. So as if that's a 
taint on his honor, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, of anything that is giving him sharaf, giving him honor and nobility, especially amongst people who are, many of the men in America are gay. You understand what I'm saying? Like, I'm talking about the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam in a language that gives him honor in a society where very, a large population of the men in America are gay or bisexual. And then I refer to the Prophet sallallahu as an alpha male, and you say that that is a, a dishonoring the Prophet sallallahu you got to be kidding me. You have got to be kidding me. And then they use um, some, you know, some quote from some psychologists, disbelieving psychologists, right? That's, that's the funny thing about it. <laughs> I'm referring to the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa as an alpha male, because you can only be an alpha or beta. <laughs> There's no in between. So if the Prophet wasn't an alpha male, then he was a beta male, which is young kus min chetnihi, then you are actually taken away from his status. But I'm referring to the Prophet wasallam as an alpha male in an environment where the vast majority of the men are either gay or homosexual or bisexual. You understand? That gives the Prophet wasallam honor. But you guys are so ignorant. You guys are so ignorant that you don't even understand cultural contexts. <laughs> You don't even understand. Anyway, but you say that uh, I, oh, he quotes Kufar. He quotes Kafirs, right? This is the way that you refer to non-Muslims, right? Even though the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam honored many of the non-Muslims in his environment who aided him and provided resources to him at a time when he could not provide resources to himself. And I'm going to give you an example for that too. From Sahil Bukhari. So no one can say, oh, he's quoting Da'if Hadith. Now I'm going to cut off all avenues for you to wiggle out of this. But, Carter G. Woodson, he said, if you can control a man's thinking, you do not have to worry about his actions. When you determine what a man shall think, you don't have to concern yourself about what he'll do. If you make a man feel that he is inferior... African American Salafi Da'is Imams, people that keep flip flopping, jumping from one bandwagon to another, Dawood Adib, jumping from one bandwagon to another, 60 something years old, and you humble yourself in front of people that are less qualified than you, less educated than you, less culturally understanding than you. Are you kidding me, man? How in the world are we supposed to have respect for you as a leader in the community? And this is what you do out of fear, fear of being warned against. Right. He said that if you make a man feel inferior, right, you do not have to compel him to accept an inferior status. He'll seek it himself. <laughs> He'll automatically fall in line. You don't have to. All right, when you make a man feel inferior, he'll automatically take an inferior position. If you make a man think that he is unjustly an outcast, you don't have to order him to the back door. He'll go without being told. And if there is no back door, his very nature will demand one. So here we are, imams, Salafi imams that have taken a more inferior, right, a more inferior status always looking for the back door, championing everybody else's issues but your own. That's back door. You don't have to tell him to go to the back door, he'll go on his own. And if there is no back door, he'll create one. Because his very nature tells him that he is inferior. So here you are, championing the issues of this shake and that shake, Salafi publications, you promote Salafi publications more than you promote yourself. <laughs> How does, how does that even look? And this is what many African American Salafis represent. Instead of taking a more leadership role in their communities, they would much rather accept a subpar position behind the people who perpetuate their own dysfunction and their own marginalization and their own subclass status. Whether here in the U.S. with people like Abu Hassan and Malik, Abu Hassan Malik Green, is a young individual who was under the tutelage of Abu Muslima. Abu Muslima was very fond of him. And he was in from the African-American community from the very beginning. 
seemed to have a bright future from the very beginning to some unfortunate circumstances, which I'm not going to go into right now. However, if you go into Philadelphia right now, Abu Hassan Malik is behind Hassan Somali, who's not an African American, doesn't share the African American experience, comes from Wales, right? European, who lands smack dead in the slums of Philadelphia. How? I don't know. Where you came from, how you got there. You understand what I'm saying? And the person that was already there, Abu Hassan Malik, who has been there from the very beginning, from the very beginning he was there, you are behind Hassan Somali. How did that happen? This inferior position. Inferior position. Or in the UK. Or in the UK. You have students like Bilal Davis, who although not a graduate, but was a fairly decent student of knowledge. Far more, more studious than uh, Abu Khadija. <laughs> By leaps and bounds. But yet, Bilal Davis would take a more inferior position behind Abu Khadija. If you make a man feel that he is inferior, you do not have to compel him to take a more inferior position. He'll take it automatically. That's your nature. I get it. What's the problem with that? The problem with that is that Bilal Davis is the real MVP. <laughs> That's the problem with that. He's the real student of knowledge. And Abu Khadija is not, did not sit at the feet of a scholar, cannot even pronounce the Quran properly. <laughs> that's, the, that's the real reason why. And this is aside from my personal issues with uh, Bilal Davis. I'm just speaking facts right now. I'm speaking facts right now. But you'll always be behind Abu Khadija, Bilal Davis. You'll always be behind him. You'll always be in his shadow. You'll always be second best. Not even second best. You third best to Amjad Rafiq, who is another individual who never studied anywhere. <laughs> you never studied anywhere. How did you get this position? How? And people who actually really did study are always inferior, always taking a subclass position. So... Many of the problems in the African-American community are symptoms of the root causes that are almost always ignored. And I'm beginning to think that it's intentional. For example, let me just go here real quick. For example, Hamza Yusuf. Hamza Yusuf, with all due respect to uh, the work that he has done in the American Muslim community, I have a great deal of respect for Hamza Yusuf aside from whatever his uh, philosophy is and whatever his approach to Islam is. Uh, he is a scholar nonetheless, and he has put in tremendous work in the American Muslim community. Nonetheless, um, he callously uttered at the Reviving the Islamic Spirit conference that the problem with the black community is the breakdown of the black family. Right? That's what he said. And he alluded to the fact that there is no police brutality because 50% of the black on black crime, 50% of the murders in the black community is black on black crime. So that was very dismissive. <laughs> there is no police brutality. We holler, he said, we holler about police brutality, but we never say anything about the black on black crime. And it seemed like a, it seemed like a, a, a legitimate point. But let me, let me explain. So, the black on black crime in the black community, for all of those who like to speak about black issues but don't understand the black experience, right? We love to speak about issues related to black folk, but we never understand the experience of black folk, right? We sit from a place of privilege and say that the problem in the black community is the black family, the breakdown of the black family. And that we holler about police brutality when the vast majority, 50% of the murders in the black community is black on black crime. <laughs> That's what he said. Okay. But he never addressed that the black on black crime in the black community 
as well as the breakdown of the black fam fam family is all symptomatic of the white supremacist, sup supremacist system under which the black families are broken. <laughs> Where did the black families get broken? <laughs> Please tell me, who broke the black family except the white supremacist system that we live under? <laughs> but he'll never say anything about that, but you'll address the black family and the black on black crime and black communities. MashaAllah, tabarakallah. We'll talk about the dysfunctional black family which is simply a symptom of the root cause, which is white supremacy. So let me break it down for all of you um, naysayers. We got a lot of David Clarks in our communities. You know who David Clark is? David Clark is the Milwaukee sheriff who said that Donald Trump doesn't have a, a racist bone in his body and that there is no such thing as police brutality. We got a lot of David Clarks in our community amongst African-American Muslims. Masha Allah, tabarakallah. So let me tell you why there's black on black crime in the black community. Let me tell you why the black family is broken down. Let me explain that to you as an African American. The prison industrial complex, right? The machine, right? The machine. They just built a $35 million prison in Philadelphia, in the city of Philadelphia. <laughs> Instead of taking that same $35 million and building a facility for young inner city kids where they could have somewhere to go after school, right? <laughs> but you'll take $35 million and go build a prison. <laughs> so the prison industrial complex uh, the biggest contributor to the breakdown of the black family, which Hamza Yusuf would never address. No, nah, he just addressed the black family, the dysfunctional black family, right? Um, the Salafis never addressed these issues either. As I said, they're apolitical and antisocial. They don't deal with no social issues. They don't deal with no political issues. Tawheed, 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 all day, every day. And to be honest with you, the matters of Tawheed that they are talking about, they themselves don't even understand. They themselves don't even practice. They're just regurgitating what they're reading out of a book. The thing about it is that when you close the book, <laughs> close the book and explain it to me. Because if you can't explain something, then guess what? You don't understand it. Don't close the book. Don't tell me what the shake and the shake is saying here and what the shake is saying here and the shake said here. That's 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 your whole. Emo, close the book and tell me what did Allah say, what did the messenger say, what is the issue? <laughs> because if you can't explain it, then you don't understand it. And many of them don't even understand the majority of the issues that they talk about. Nonetheless, we never address the, uh, address the prison industrial complex, right? Even though many in the Salafi communities hail from the prison cells of America. Go figure. Think about that. If we could do a percentage of how many Salafi men have actually been to prison, <laughs> I would probably say at least 70 to 75 percent of them have been in prison at some point in time in their lives. Because that's actually the direct link. The direct link. Many of them graduate from the university and they become uh, chaplains in the prison. Right? Scared to take the thobe off, scared to go out into the workforce and work for a living, but you would rather go brainwash innocent prisoners, right? Who still trying to figure it all out in prison, right? You go brainwash them, right? So that as soon as they come home, they come right into your... So you have a Salafi community, a prison to Salafi community pipeline. You, find, you follow me? Understand the blueprint. They come straight from prison right into the Salafi community. So you have a direct link from the prison all the way to the Salafi community. And unfortunately, from the, the prison to the Salafi community pipeline leads to the women in the community because you're the one that's marrying them. You're marrying them even before they come home from prison. Yeah. Tell me I'm lying. <laughs> Tell me I'm lying. <laughs> I mean, I'm just stating facts here. Don't, don't hate me for giving you the message. 
I'm just stating the facts here. There's a prison to Salafi community pipeline. And that pipeline leads directly to the sisters, our daughters, our mothers, our sisters in the community. Because they're not going to an indo pak masjid to marry none of their they daughters, their sisters. They're not going to any Arab communities to marry their daughters and their sisters. They're not going to the Albanian community to marry their daughters and their sisters. They're not going to the Yemeni community to marry their daughters and their sisters. Where they coming to marry the daughters and sisters of African Americans? We got to deal with that. Right? But we don't say nothing about that. You write an article about the nation of Islam, but you don't say anything about the African-American Salafis who are going in and out of the prison system. Many of them engage in homosexual behaviors while they're in prison and then come home and engage in those behaviors with our daughters and our, wives and our sisters and our daughters. Ain't no sex to the end of it. You come home from prison, we marry you to one of our daughters and you have an anal sex with our daughters, with our sisters. This is not prison. This is what's going on, man. But we don't say nothing about that. All right? Many Salafis hail from the prison cells of prisons around um, America and we say nothing about it. Um, African Americans... If you didn't know, we only make up 13% of the American population. Did you know that? We're actually a minority. African Americans make up how much? 13% of the American population. You know how much percentage we make up of the prison population? 60 to 70% of the inmates in prison are African American. How? How do we make up 13% of the population in America but we make up 60 to 70 percent of the prison population in the prison industrial complex. Right. And we say nothing about that. But we'll talk about the breakdown of the black family. Right. Hamza Yusuf. We'll talk about the breakdown of the black family and how dysfunctional the black community is. But we don't talk about the white supremacist system under which the black families are broken. Don't you know in Maryland alone, in Maryland, just Two states over from you guys. You have New Jersey, you have Delaware, and then you have Maryland. In Maryland, according to a 2016 study, 72% of the prison population in Maryland are African American. 72%, three, almost three quarters of the population of inmates in Maryland are African American. That means that they're 6% black, 2% Hispanic, and 1% white. So even white people in the prison population are 1%. <laughs> they're even the 1% even in prison. And that explains where a lot of our fathers, right, the breakdown of the black family, that explains where a lot of our fathers are. They're in prison. <laughs> One out of every three African-American males will have some connection to the prison industrial complex at some point or form in their lives. No other culture in America has those statistics. No other culture. So for sisters wondering where all the, why the shallow pool of men for African-American men in the Muslim communities, there you have it. You're wondering where all these single sisters and all of these single, these children growing up under single parents, you want to know where their fathers are, that's where they are. 72%. Right? Years ago, women could not qualify for Section 8 or housing if there was a man living in the home. So what that did was it forced African American women to go down to Section 8 and file for housing, but they had to tell them that there was not a man living at home. And then they had to come and inspect. Think about the psychology. You got to come and inspect and make sure there's no man in the house. You understand? No man in the house. So a person comes and expects the house to make sure there's no man in the house. <laughs> black man is in the house. They don't have to inspect no more because black men not in the homes anymore. Because <laughs> you done chased them out of the homes today. Sisters, thank you for that. <laughs> and subhanAllah. 
They had to go down and file for Section 8, file for housing, and tell them there was no man in the home. Parolees, people that were being paroled from home. You can't even be paroled to your wife and your children if they were on Section 8 or housing. You couldn't even be paroled home to your own family. You had to be paroled to your mother's house, to your aunt's house, and go sleep on somebody's couch and sneak over to your wife's house and visit your wife and your children. Because if they popped up and a man was there, then they would snatch her Section 8 from her. You understand? No other culture in America has ever gone through any of that. So no, the breakdown of the black family is not due to our dysfunction. The breakdown of the black family is due to the white supremacist system that we live under. Are we, I hope we're clear about that. So no one ever says anymore, well, you know, my family came here and we, we worked our butts off. and we No, 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 no. There, there's a system in place that is designed to make you excel and designed to keep us where we are. Understand that. Understand that. And the same thing goes in the Islamic community with the Salafis who are designed to keep us busy with he said, she said, this scholar said, that scholar said, and there's no real building going on in the community. You, you, see, what I, you see how that works? The hegemony. The elite. It's the same blueprint. It's the same blueprint. Don't you see it? The Salafis. They keep you busy with this shake said, that shake said, the latest and the greatest on this refutation, that refutation. That's what you're busy with. 20 years have gone by and we're still busy with refutations. No building. None of our children are half of the Quran. Our, we lost two generations of our children. The generation that were children when I first became Muslim in 1997, those who were 12, 13, 14, 15 years old, who are now in their early 30s. We lost that generation, and many of them have children right now, and we lost that generation as well, because many of them are not even practicing Muslims. Understand, we lost two generations of our children to this, he said, she said, Kila wa call, this sheikh said, that sheikh said, this one is on it, that one is off it. We lost two generations. 20 years have gone by. And we still, Master Rahma, still sitting on the same corner. Wes Kinney, you still sitting on the same corner on top of the chicken shack. 20 years. And you still sitting in the same place. Not a pot to piss in the window to throw it out of. Go figure. This is by design, man. This ain't this not consequence. It's not coincidental. This is by grand design to keep you Negroes where you are while everybody else continues to, you know, to grow and flourish. Flourish. Understand? If you weren't clear about their agenda before, you clear about it today. Be clear. Stay woke. So these and many other elements that have contributed to the breakdown of the black family are woven into the system of white supremacy, which Hamza Yusuf conveniently failed to address, but yet he callously commented on black on black crime, the breakdown of the black family, and many, you have many, I don't want to use the word coon, but you have many people who stand up, oh, I, you know, and Hamza Yusuf, he did the classic, you know, racist, or well, my best friend is black, my best friend is black. <laughs> Right. And then you get these African-American imams and scholars that jump up and defend him. Never address the blatant disrespect on the entire African-American community. You understand? The entire African-American community, you dismissed our entire community. And then you get African-American leaders stand up and say, oh, Hamza must twist his words, put the spin on it. Oh, no, he didn't mean that. He didn't mean this. He meant it because he tried to correct himself three times. And every single time, he dug himself in a deeper hole. <laughs> Understand? There is no correcting that, Hamza Yusuf. That's what you meant. And if you say that that's what you meant, then just give us an opportunity to correct you. But don't double back and say, well, let me fix, you know what I mean? Let me fix what I said. It, it, there's, there is no fixing what you said. You said it, and that's what you meant. And that's okay, because that shows your ignorance. And then that means that we need to teach you. We need to educate you. You understand? 
But don't double back and put a spin on it and that's not what I meant, blah, blah, blah. No, because when you say that's not what I meant, then you are forfeiting the opportunity to be corrected. No love loss. It's, it just came out, you know, when a white person says, I'm not racist. <laughs> that statement, I'm not racist, means that you are racist. <laughs> it's what's called aversive racism. Do your facts. Aversive racism is that we acknowledge that we're all equal, but in fact, you still treat people differently based upon race, color, gender, right? But you stay, but you say out in the open, we're all equal, right? This is what with classic Muslim community, right? Classic. You got people posting pictures from Saudi Arabia, right? Talking about, oh, you know, we're all one ummah. There's no racism in Islam. And you are one of the racist countries in the world, Saudi Arabia. How in the world you talk about there's no racism in Islam and you posting pictures on Instagram with everybody praying together talking about there's no racism in Islam and you in one of the racist countries in the world. <laughs> Don't make me call your name out. I, I have high hopes that you know you, you went the wrong way, you lost your way and I, I'm really trying to hold my tongue for calling your name out, man. Nonetheless, um, let's go back to my statement about Musa Richardson and uh, his refutation of the nation of Islam. Let's deal with that. So I had to take you back to bring you up to speed. My comment about Musa Richardson refuting the nation of Islam um, was not me skating over the fact that their misnomers and some of their beliefs don't need to be clarified. That, that, that's not what I meant. What I was trying to do was direct his attention to more relevant social issues, such as police brutality or white supremacy, that you never hear white converts talk about. And this is where you came from. This is where you came from. So my Intention wasn't to overlook the necessity of refuting some of the misnomers and the, the, the beliefs, misbeliefs about the nation of Islam. Now that needs to be done. However, when African Americans talk about the nation of Islam, it's from a different paradigm. You see, uh, the nation of Islam used to call white people devils, blue-eyed devils. So it would only make sense that a white convert would find an opportunity to write a refutation on the nation of Islam. You understand what I'm saying? It's, it's, you know, it, it would only seem natural. <laughs> it would only seem natural to do that. However, the creation of the nation of Islam, here again, as a movement, as a religious political movement designed to improve the social and economic and mental conditions of African Americans, was here again a reaction to the same racist white supremacist system that has afforded Caucasian converts like Hamza Yusuf and Musa Richardson and Omar Quinn the privileges that they have to speak about issues that are directly related to African Americans. You understand? The Nation of Islam was created as a reaction to the white supremacist system, right, that we live under. Why did they create this century? You know, you understand? Why did they create the Nation of Islam? Because of white supremacy to restore you know, some type of dignity to African Americans, to restore some type of financial independence to African Americans. We don't throw the baby out with the bathwater. The Nation of Islam, that's part of our culture. We, we cannot get away from that. That's part of our culture. Many of our parents came into Islam from the Nation of Islam. Many of our parents, many of us would not be Muslim right now had it not been for our parents' journey to Sunni Islam through the nation of Islam. While you had Arabs that came to America, they opened up liquor stores on our corners, they opened up gas stations, and they sold us pork, they sold us alcohol, they sold us blunts, but they never sold us Islam. They never gave us Islam. You understand? Go to any bodega right here in New York, go to any bodega that's owned by an Arab and tell me that there's not blunts behind the counter. Tell me there's not alcohol in the refrigerator. Tell me they don't sell pork. They're not talking to you about Islam. As a matter of fact, you go in there with a thobo and they ask you, oh, you're Muslim? What else would I be with a thobo and a beard? 
I'm closer to Islam than you will ever be. And you asking me, am I a Muslim? Right? But we don't say anything about that. Right? Abdurrahman Omeysan, who jumps up and j barges right into the situation, completely oblivious, don't know, but you want to, you know, you want to jump on the side of the hegemony, which you, you're going to end up on the wrong pages of history, man. Abdurrahman Omeysan, if you want to address something, address the Yemeni bodegas that sell people pork, alcohol, that sell young African-American men blunts. You want to address something? Don't jump into these issues, man. These issues will get you jammed up for the rest of your life, man. You just came home from Saudi Arabia, man. Don't do it to yourself. Anyway, and then you, on top of that, you endorse an Abu Yusuf Khalifa. Like, our brothers from Salafi publications like Hassan al-Somali and Abu Yusuf Khalifa. Man, you sound, you sound silly. Who in their right mind endorses Abu Yusuf Khalifa? I mean, like, come on. I, you got to come better than that, man. Many of our parents came into Islam through the nation of Islam. Not that this garners them any sort of exemption status. It doesn't mean that because our parents came into Islam through the nation of Islam that they are exempt from being warned against or their beliefs are exempt from being corrected and clarified. But when we address the nation of Islam, we're going to do it with mercy and compassion because we understand that our parents came from that. Our parents came from that. We understand that that is part of our culture, that's part of our history, we can't get away from that. But you see, the plight of the Salafi movement, the greater Salafi movement, is to keep us detached from anything that is black. Anything that is African American, if you notice, from the time that you've been Muslim, you can endorse any Arab, any Arab community, any Arab movement, but you better not say anything about African Americans. Nothing. Evidenced by the fact that we're having this discussion right now. Because the moment I say that I cater to my people, I'm a nationalist. <laughs> Who else am I going to cater to? <laughs> Who else am I going to cater to? I'm African American. I came from the slums of New Jersey, East Orange, New Jersey. Who else am I going to cater to? Right. We can endorse everybody else, but the moment we say we want to concentrate on issues that are related to us, no, nah, you can't do that. So they keep you separated from anything, and this is why many African American Muslims have no identity. We have nothing to identify with. Pakistani Muslims can always be Pakistani. They can put on a two-piece Pakistani outfit. They can eat curry and rice all day long. Nobody say a word. Albanian, uh, Albanian Muslims, they can open up an Albanian masjid and they can still be connected to their culture and nobody says a word. Arabs, they can be a Yemeni community, they can be, you know, Palestinian community, nobody says a word. But the moment you say I'm African American and I'm concentrating on issues related to my people, you are a nationalist. Masha Allah, Tabarakallah. Ikna does a yearly conference in Baltimore, Maryland, right? One of the poorest cities in the world, in America. They do this huge conference every year in Baltimore. Thousands and thousands of people come to this conference. Last year, they had a 21 shake roster. 21 scholars. Not one African American. Not one. You got Siraj, Imam Siraj who's, you know, does the fundraising. <laughs> Maybe one other I saw, but 1920 Pakistani Imams, students of knowledge, nobody ever says that's nationalism. <laughs> nobody ever says that's nationalism. Because as minorities, we have to push the agenda of everybody else. And we can never push an agenda that serves our interests. You understand how that works? Because you are a minority. You're not allowed to concentrate on your people. You're not allowed to concentrate on your issues. You have to push the issues of the hegemony, of the vast majority, of the elite. You're not allowed to talk about issues that are related to your people. But everybody else can. Go figure. The Prophet 
as I said before, he didn't disregard, he didn't disregard um, issues um, that he was assisted with by non-Muslims. So when we talk about being merciful to the nation of Islam and compassionate with the nation of Islam, some of our parents are still in the nation of Islam. And they're our parents. And we love them. We love we love. Them. So why would we go out and speak about the nation of Islam in a manner that is disrespectful when many of our parents still have one foot in the nation of Islam? They can't get with this stuff. Many of our parents, they experience with the nation of Islam. This stuff is foreign to them. You can't concentrate on black issues. Black people don't have no, you got these hole in the wall masjids. When you were in the nation of Islam, you were actually doing much better. <laughs> you understand what I'm saying? We were actually doing much better economically in terms of brotherhood. <laughs> we were actually doing a, a lot better. And then only to come into what we perceive to be Sunni, real Islam, and we're actually doing worse. So many of our parents are not buying into this whole Salafi being on the hop. They're not buying it. Because they hear a lot of this, but they don't really see much being produced. So they have one foot in the nation of Islam, or one foot in the War of Deen community, and one foot in Sunni Islam. And so when we deal with them, we deal with them with mercy and compassion. As the Prophet ﷺ, let me share something with you. The Prophet ﷺ, uh, he went to Ta'if to go give da'wah. You remember, you guys probably remember this story. But there's a portion of this story that most people are not familiar with. And it's in Sahih al-Bukhari. When the Prophet wasallam went to Ta'if to give da'wah, he stayed there for 10 days, knocking on people's doors, trying to call them to Islam. And when he left out of Mecca to go to Ta'if, Quraysh took an oath that Muhammad could not come back to Mecca. Many people are not familiar with that. When the Prophet ﷺ went to Ta'if to give the people da'wah, Quraysh stood in unison, in solidarity with one another that the Prophet ﷺ, Muhammad, was not to step foot back into Mecca. And if he did, they were going to kill him. When the Prophet ﷺ went to Ta'if to give them da'wah, the people of Ta'if, they made mockery of him, they made fun of him. And they even told their slaves and their children to throw rocks at him as a sign of disrespect. How are you as a messenger, a man, and you're having your children throw rocks at him? The ultimate of humiliation. Your slaves, we're talking about a slave throwing rocks at a free man. Not just a free man, a Qurashi from Beni Hashem. You understand? From the elite of Mecca. And you got your slave throwing rocks at him. And they chased him out of the city. And then of course we know the angel of the mountain came and even he was still merciful to them. On his way back to uh, Mecca, he knew that he couldn't come back to Mecca. So he had to find a way for somebody to protect him. He had to have some protection to get him back into Mecca. So he went to a man, uh, he sent Zayd ibn Haritha, who was with him on the journey to Ta'if. He sent Zayd into Mecca to go find somebody who would, you know, protect him. He had no protection. So Zayd came across a man by the name of Mut'im ibn Adi, who was a disbeliever. And he told the Prophet wasallam that he would give him protection. The Arabs, they had honor amongst them. So if you said, he's under my protection, and anybody who respected you, they had to respect that. It's like in the hood. Like you get chased out of the hood, and then you go to, you know, one of them, one of them dudes that say, all right, I got you. And they go back to the rest of the goons in the hood and say, yo, don't nobody say nothing to them. We already know how that go. All right? Many people get chased out of their hoods. Can't come back. Right? Same thing. Mut'im ibn Adi, he said that the Prophet ﷺ was under his protection. The Prophet was under his protection. And he told his sons, and he told his brother, and his brother's tribe. And they all suited up, ready to go to war with their own tribe, Quraysh, to protect somebody that he did not even share the same faith with him. You understand? It was an issue of honor. 
And Mut'im ibn Adi, he told his sons, four of his sons, to stand guard on each corner of the Kaaba and protect Muhammad as he walked into his home. When Abu Jahl saw the Prophet ﷺ walk back into Mecca, he asked, is Muhammad a follower or has he mujir, has he been protected, he been given protection? He said, nah, he was, he was given protection. So he said, well, if Mutab ibn Aji gave him protection, then he's protected. We can't touch him. Later on, years later, when the Prophet ﷺ migrated to Medina, it shows that the Prophet ﷺ at that time, he was very limited in resources, in terms of protection, in terms of armor, in terms of, of an army to protect him. Nor was he allowed to defend himself. And he had to rely on the help of someone who was a non-Muslim. Understand? How did the Prophet ﷺ repay this man? Mut'im ibn Adi, he died on kufr, died as an idolater. And after the battle of Badr, the Prophet ﷺ, they had 70 captives from the chiefs of Quraysh. And the Prophet ﷺ, he said, Wallahi, لو كان مطعم ابن عادي حيا وكلمني في هؤلاء لتركتهم له. He said, I swear by Allah, if مطعم ابن عادي was alive today and he spoke to me on behalf of these 70 captives, I would let them go on the strength of what مطعم ابن عادي did for me. You understand? What's my point here? My point here is even though the nation of Islam is on kufr. Their beliefs are akin to the beliefs of people who disbelieve in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. We still deal with them with mercy and compassion because many of our parents came into Sunni Islam through them. You understand? Don't say, run away and say, oh, Shadi Muhammad says that we should be merciful to the nation of Islam. Obviously, somebody like Abu Khadija, who is Kashmiri slash Pakistani, Somebody like Musa Richardson who is Caucasian and somebody who like Umar Quinn is Caucasian. Obviously people like them would have no mercy or compassion for the nation of Islam. Why would you expect them to? That's not their experience. That's our experience. And what we try to do is we try to make us like we're monolithic in terms of culture. We're, mo we're not monolithic in terms of culture. My culture is different than your culture. Don't try to understand my culture. Right? Don't try to relate to the experiences that fashioned and made me who I am. That's not your culture. I am not going to dismiss the nation of Islam. That's part of our culture. That's part of our narrative, part of our experience, part of how we got here. And many people from the nation of Islam have left the nation of Islam and came over to Sunni Islam because of the good character of the Sunni Muslims who take time out to go back and explain real Islam to them like Tahir Wyatt did. Many of them convert to Islam. Many of them have converted to Islam. You understand? And if we go out and we bash these people, call them kufar and disrespect them, obviously we would, we would expect somebody who is not part of that culture to be disrespectful, to use language, to use terms that are demeaning and belittling. We would expect that from them. I would expect that from a white convert. I would expect that from a Pakistani Muslim who's been born and raised Muslim all his life and all he knows as it relates to people who have my skin color is that we are inferior than they are. When you walk into a predominantly, you walk into a Pakistani store, Punjabi store, you walk into a Bangladeshi store, as an African American, do you think you, they, see, I, they see me like they see their own children? Absolutely not. Absolutely not. So understand the factors that are at play here, man. So the Prophet Wasallam, you know, he compensated him for that. And that was out of respect for what he did for him. So when we address the nation of Islam, we're going to do it with mercy and compassion and, you know, clarify the errors. But in hopes that the people that are still connected to the nation of Islam. So I'm not saying that we shouldn't refute the nation of Islam. Or we shouldn't refute some of their misnomers and some of their misbeliefs. But what I am saying is that. As a Caucasian convert to Islam, that's not your place. That's not your place. But you would rather talk about that than talk about white supremacy. Talk about police brutality. Issues that are directly related to the culture that you come from. Alright? 
And the fact of the matter is that we can't allow stuff like this. As African American Muslims, we have to put people in their places. Aisha radiallahu ta'ala anha, she said, Umirna and nunazila nas manazilahum. We have been commanded to put everyone in a proper place. That's not your place. That's not your place, Moses Richardson. That's not your place. Absolutely, Umar Quinn sounds like an African American. <laughs> You, you've been eating a little too much fried chicken. You sound like an African American, but you're not an African American. When you were the imam of the African American community, Master Rahma, you lived in Bloomfield, which is predominantly white. Understand? You lived in Bloomfield. But then you come down to the African American community, you sound black, you married to an African American. You know what I mean? Like, you want the African American experience without a actually being in the African American experience. Sorry, man. We can't allow that no more, man. We can't allow that no more. I'm sorry. We need to call that stuff out. We're not monolithic in our culture and our cultural experiences. Nah, man. Nah. So. A Caucasian convert to Islam who in most instances got his exposure indirectly from the nation of Islam and not from the Arabs that they try so earnestly to identify with, right? You speak from a place of privilege. Musa Richardson, Umar Quinn, and many other Caucasian converts to Islam, many of you came to Islam through the nation of Islam, whether you realize it or not. <laughs> Many of you came to Islam through the nation of Islam, whether you realize it or not. But yet, you try to identify with the Arabs, because you, you don't necessarily want to identify with us, but you identify with the Arabs, but they didn't call you to Islam. They didn't call you to Islam. African American Muslims called you to Islam. And, you know, as Muslims, we, we give them the pass to do that, and we can't do that. And we give them the pass to do that, under a more pristine interpretation of Islam, void of cultural lines, right? We got to whitewash our culture, right, in order to fit in. And that seems to be the plight, to erase any and all cultural references of African Americans by which we can formulate an identity culturally. Arabs can be Arabs, Pakistanis can be Pakistanis, but African Americans have to whitewash their culture, dismissing anything that has to do with our narrative and include everybody else. So we can identify. I can, as an African American Muslim, I can put on a thobe, I can put on a Pakistani gear, and I'll fit right in with the Muslim culture. But the moment I put on a pair of jeans, the moment I put on a hoodie, the moment I dress like the people of my culture, oh, you look like the kuffar, right? You look like kafirs. Take off those kafir clothes. Well, guess what? The thobe is not a Muslim dress either. <laughs> you have non-Muslim Arabs that wear thobes. <laughs> You understand? Non-Muslim Arabs who wear thobes. <laughs> but take off them Kafir clothes. So our children can't identify with this colorless narrative. Our children can't identify with this colorless narrative. And this interpretation that of Islam that doesn't resonate with them. They can identify with Abu Khadija. They can identify with Hassan Somali. They can identify with Hamza Yusuf. They can identify with Musa Richardson. They can identify with Omar Quinn, but they can't identify with imams and students of knowledge that look like them, that sound like them, that come from where they come from. Every African American Muslim who just about 98%, 98% with the small 2% that, you know, uh, advocate for their agenda. Every other African American graduate from the Islamic University, from Abdullah Hakim Quick all the way down to Shadid Muhammad, has been warned against and is a deviant. There is no coincidence to that. Abdullah Hakim Quick, who has a PhD, is a deviant. Uh, Bilal Phillips, who has a PhD, is a deviant. Ha uh, uh, Siraj Wahaj, been in the Muslim community from day one, is a deviant. Tarheer Wyatt, deviant. Ali Davis, deviant. Shadid Muhammad, deviant. Muhammad Mufti Munir, deviant. Fahim Lee, deviant. Akil uh, Ingram, deviant. Akil Walker, deviant. And all of them, the common thread on all of them is that they're African American. Every single one of them is African American. 
Every single one of them. So my child cannot find one African American Muslim imam, da'i student of knowledge who is actually on the right path, that looks like him, that comes from where he comes from. Identity means everything, man. Image means everything. And if you can't find something that my child is not going to identify with Abu Khadija. You see what Abu Khadija looked like? He looks like a Pakistani. My child is not going to identify with that. That's not to say that my child can't benefit from somebody that is not African American. But we're talking about establishing an Islamic identity rooted in your culture. And everybody else can have that with the except of us. Unfortunately. So this dismissive approach of addressing the symptoms and not addressing the root causes, it only serves to further the marginalized African-American Muslim community and perpetuates the stigma of our dysfunction as a people while allowing, uh, while allowing convert Muslims from other ethnicities to continue using our communities and our issues and our pain and our dysfunction, our manufactured dysfunction. Right? As launch pads for their notoriety and developing careers in Islamic preaching and teaching. And even more insulting is the clapping, the applause that Hamza Yusuf got when he made the, when he made the statement. People clapping like what he said was actually the truth. <laughs> that was the most insulting thing, you know, unfortunately. All right? And of course, you know, Musa Richardson gets the stamp of approval, you know, the stamp of approval for refuting the nation of Islam. Right. So in addition to all of this, another student of knowledge, a uh, student of rhetoric, right? Because there's a difference between a student of knowledge and a student of rhetoric. All right. Rhetoric, all right, the student of knowledge is a person who comes into a community and he seeks to advance that community, bring that community to another level in their understanding of Islam. They seek to improve the condition of the communities that they are in. And then you have the students of rhetoric, which all they spew is rhetoric, year after year after year go by rhetoric, and there's no improvement in the community. So you have to identify who is the imam of your community. Is he a student of knowledge, or is he a student of rhetoric? So we have another student of rhetoric by the name of Mustafa George. Oh yeah, this is our David Clark, our very own personal David Clark, cooning as the days go by. He released a, a, a audio recording the day after I did my interview on the night shift, and he referred to me as a racist. This is a African American referring to another African American as a racist. <laughs> I mean, like, go figure. In what world? That's like one plus one equaling three, right? <laughs> this is an African American referring to another African American as a racist because he said that Caucasian Muslims should not engage in predominantly issues that are related to African American issues, right? So that makes me a racist, right? He referred to me as a racist and he referred to my dawah as being nationalistic or a call to nationalism. Couple of things I want to highlight here about Mustafa George. Number one, Mustafa George is known to be a flunky for the global campaign of Salafi publication, the business of Salafi publication. Oh, yes, they're a business. They're a business. They made in 2016, their net worth was 405,000 pounds. Yeah. Public record. This is not private information. I, I'll share it, actually. I'll share the whole record on my Facebook page. 405,000 pounds they gross. That was their net worth in 2016. They are a business. Make no mistake about it. They are a business. Abu Sama just made Hajj, and he said that Abu Khadija and company were on the same plane with him. All right? I want you guys to listen to this, all right? Because this is the double standard, right? This is the devil standard. So Abu Sama, he did a video. He did a video recording. I have the video on my phone. He did a video recording. He just made Hajj. He said when they got to the airport in Manchester, Abu Khadija and company, all right, you know they do a Hajj package every year too, right? Of course, this is how they generate their money. 
But here's the kicker. He said, Abu Khadija and company were at the airport. He said, and guess who they were chaperoning to Hajj? Who was on their Hajj package? Dio Bendis and Brailwees. Yeah, go figure. <laughs> go figure. Dio Bendis and Brailwees. And if my memory serves me correctly, Dio Bendis have some Rafida mentality. They have some Rafida beliefs, some Shiite heavy Sufi beliefs. And these are the people that they are accompanying, right, to Hajj. Right? If an African, if a Salafi is so much caught talking to a deviant, there's a question mark over his head. If a Salafi is so much as caught talking to a deviant, <laughs> then he is con there's a question mark over his head. Here you are taking money from Dio Bendis, taking money from Brailwees. I'm dead serious. Wallahi, tallahi, billahi, I kid you not. Abu Sama was right there on the plane with them. Abu Sama said, I even told them, MashaAllah, you're doing a good job with the way you're treating them. <laughs> it's unfortunate you treat other Muslims like crack, like they're kufar, but you treat the Dio Bendis, your, your customers, right? You treat the Dio Bendis and you treat the Brailwees like, you know, MashaAllah. And we understand because those are your customers. <laughs> those are your customers. That's how you make your money. Yeah, but their net worth was... Um, their net worth was over a half, half a million dollars last year alone. And I'm sure all of that didn't come from book sales. <laughs> yeah. So who's funding you? Let's, let's, that, that's the real question. <laughs> Who is funding Salafi publications to keep poor African-American communities marginalized, voiceless? Who's funding you? I mean, I'll leave you to tell that. Because you, you had almost 204,000 pounds in donations. And I'm sure the 246,000 pounds that you received in donations did not come from Salafis. Because Salafis is broke. At least African American Salafis. We don't have a pot to piss in the window to throw it out of. We don't have a pot to piss in the window to throw it out of. So where'd you get the 246,000 pounds in donations to Salafi publications? Please tell me. I'll wait. <laughs> I'll wait for that answer. I can be on my deathbed and I'll still want to hear that answer. The angel of death could be standing over me to snatch my soul out of my body and I would still want to hear that answer. I'm not saying where it's from. <laughs> I'm just throwing the facts out there. And this is public record. They're a non-for-profit organization. That's public record. <laughs> or they're a for-profit organization. That's public record. <laughs> Anybody can go on to whatever site and find it. You understand? It's public, public information. 246,000 pounds. Almost a quarter of a million dollars. And donations, financial donations. And I'm just trying to figure out, like, where all this money coming from? Because in the Salafi community, y'all don't encourage y'all don't encourage Salafis to get jobs. <laughs> I've never heard a khutbah or a lecture about getting a good job in the Salafi community. As a matter of fact, y'all might be a jobs. <laughs> You're against job, anti career, anti jobs. No, I'm just, I'm just, right? 330 U.S., 330,000 U.S. dollars. That, that's just in donations. Book sales was like 140, 140,000 pounds in book sales. And of course, you got to keep the agenda going because you guys got to sell books, right? That's the deal that you had with Sheikh Obey, Right? The deal you had with Sheikh Obey is that you would publish his books, you would translate his books, publish his books, and then you would give the Sheikh a portion of the money, and then y'all would keep a portion of the money, right? That's how it goes, right? 
Which is why when I translated Sheikh Obey's book, you fought so hard to go back and get the Sheikh to say he never gave me permission because I got to the book before you did. Right. And Sheikh Obey tried to hustle me out of all of my money. Yeah. Let's talk about that. Sheikh Obey told me he wanted every single dime that I earned from selling that book, The Six Fundamental Principles. Yeah. And I told him I ain't giving you a dime. Sorry. And then that's when he went on his rampage, his rant about me stealing his book, right? <laughs> I mean, like, you guys, I mean, like, you, you can't, I can't make this stuff up, man. Wallah aladheem, I cannot make this stuff up, man. Real talk. I want you to see the Salafi publications that you haven't seen before. The other side of Salafi publications. So Mustafa George, this, um, you know, this flunky for Salafi publications, they actually don't really need him unless they need him, right? He's the standby guy who they call on to reach out to the African-American community to ride their bandwagon. He is our David Clark. Shout out to Mustafa George. You are our David Clark. Absolutely. Because you would probably fight tooth and nail to say that uh, Salafi publications are not racist. But you'll call another African-American racist. <laughs> you'll call another African-American racist. This is not backbiting. This is all public information. I'm just consolidating everything for you. It's all over the place. I'm just consolidating everything for you. Number two, how could an African-American refer to another African-American as being racist, bigoted, or nationalist, except, if he, except that it is indicative of his own detachment from his own community, the only community that he can identify with? Either Mustafa George's views are highly influenced by others, namely Abu Khadija and company. I mean, how else would an African-American refer to another African-American as a racist, as a bigot, as a nationalist, who put the battery in your back? Who, I mean, like, whose sentiments are you sharing? Because those can't possibly be your thoughts about me, and you're an African American. Those are somebody else's thoughts that they projected on you, and now you are projecting those on everybody else. No African American in their right mind would refer to another African American as a racist. Like, I mean, it doesn't even make sense. It's actually oxymoronic. So either his views are highly influenced, influenced by others who are outside of his ethnic background, so he felt obligated to release a response almost immediately. The very next day, after I did the night shift lecture, the very next day, Mustafa George released an audio as his official statement that I was a racist. But here's the kicker. We've never seen Mustafa George move that fast. When Abdul Wali was accused of raping his stepdaughter, this is public news, I'm not backbiting, this is public news. When Abdul Wali Nelson from Philadelphia, accusations were spiraling, spiraling around in this, the community in Philadelphia. Abdul Wali Nelson, I'll say it again, Abdul Wali Nelson, who was accused of molesting molesting his own stepdaughter from the ages of 11 to 17. Mustafa George, did you release a statement then? Did you release a statement then? <laughs> but you release a statement when I say that Musa Richardson should stay in his lane and talk about matters of white supremacy and matters of police brutality and stay away from the nation of Islam. That's not his lane. You jump up and say, I'm a, I'm a racist. <laughs> you issue a statement almost immediately that I'm a racist. But when Abdul Wali Nelson was accused of raping his stepdaughter, molesting his stepdaughter for six years straight, Mustafa George, did you release an audio for that? Did you say anything about that? Did you even feel anything in your heart about that? <laughs> Because the Prophet ﷺ said that when you see a wrong, you should change it with your hands 
And, uh, you know, Abdul Wali Nelson, you'll deal with that when the father of that girl, you know, get to you. He'll change it with his hands. I'm, I'm sure of that. That I'm sure of. Inshallah. You got whatever's coming to you. Change it with your hands. Say something about it with your tongue. Or at least hate it in your heart. Did you even hate it in your heart? Because you, you damn sure didn't say anything about it. And you damn sure didn't change anything with your hands. So did you even hate it in your heart? <laughs> yeah, they swept it under the rug like they do everything else. But Shadi Muhammad went to the movies. Oh, we go into the shake. And we're going to put a, we're going to plaster it all over the internet. Shadi Muhammad went to this movies with his wife. He went to the movies with this one. And we're going to plaster it all over the internet. <laughs> we're even going to get a verdict from a scholar to say that he is not even fit to give dawah. Wallahi, I'm not fit to give dawah because I went to the movies. But you say nothing about your companion who not, he didn't go to the movies. He molested a girl, his stepdaughter, who he should have been protecting who he should have been nurturing. Don't you know that the Prophet Wasallam said, whoever has a daughter and raises her to the age of maturity and then teaches her good manners and then marries her off, he will be in Jannah with me like this. You, sw you squandered that opportunity by letting the shaitan get the best of you and you molested this girl. So they say. I never really, you know what I mean? Like my heart went out to the young girl. I didn't really care to get into all of the details of this, you know, of the situation. And I never really cared to write anything on it. And, you know, I, there was times when I, my heart cried and I felt like, you understand? Yeah, Abdul Wali was the one who went to Sheikh Obeid about me going to the movies. The, the irony in that. <laughs> the irony in that, right? It was Abdul Wali Nelson... It was Abu Hassan Malik who had his share, right? Maybe two years later, a woman stood up and said she was pregnant by Abu Hassan Malik and wasn't married to him, right? But you exposed that this person went to the movies. And this was public knowledge. She said this in public in front of everybody. <laughs> I mean, I'm just, I'm just saying the irony in it, how it just comes back to you. The only one left is Anwar Wright. <laughs> Allah has dealt with everybody that was involved in that. The only one left is Anwar Wright. And Anwar, if, if you keep playing, um, you ain't innocent either. <laughs> Don't, you ain't innocent. Sometimes I'm silent on issues because it's out of mercy. I'm hoping that the person at some point find their way and they you know, make Toba and they find their way back. You understand? I'm not silent about certain things because... You know what I mean? Like, I, I can't. I could have did what I'm doing right now. I could have did this years ago. You know what I'm saying? I could have did this years ago. But you, you're, you're silent and you're patient and you let the people talk. You let them say what they want to say. You understand what I'm saying? And you're sitting back and you're making dua for them. You're hoping that they change their ways. You're hoping that at some point they find another enemy. They find another boogeyman to, you know, go attack. You know what I mean? I, I'm, not, I'm not innocent either. But I don't call people stuff out. <laughs> I mean, I've never committed zina. I've never, you know, don't put me in that category. <laughs> don't put me in that category. <laughs> never done anything remotely close to that. <laughs> so the whole you're not innocent either. But I don't go around putting everybody's business on front street. See, the thing is, is that if you are Salafi, right? If you're Salafi and you know that you have all of these skeletons in your closet, the smart thing to do would be to just keep quiet about certain matters, right? Mustafa George. Let me tell you about this guy, Mustafa George. And any of the brothers that were students of knowledge in uh, Medina during the early part of 2000, you know what I'm talking about. Mustafa George went down to Jeddah and he told some of the brothers in Jeddah to make dua to Allah to have sex with a jinn. Wallahu alazim, I kid you not. I went to Mustafa George myself and I asked him, I said, yo, please tell me this is not true. You told brothers to make dua to Allah to have sex with a jinn? He said, yeah, because he had sex with a jinn before and it was, an, it was a good experience. I said, man, he was like, I was going through something at the time. I was living in Jeddah. I was going through something at the time. And I'm saying, you have got to be kidding me, man. 
And these are the people who you're taking your religion from. These are the people who you listening to. Mufti already told you he was sitting at home with Anwar wrong and the van went off and he said, Anwar, we going to Masjid and pray. He said, nah, I'll pray later. This is the people you taking your deen from. These are the people that you hail as Salafis, the imams of these communities. You understand? These are the people that you push to the forefront as being leaders in your community. You gotta be kidding me, man. You have got to be kidding me. No wonder we are a laughing stock amongst the other communities. No wonder as African American Muslims, nobody takes us serious. No wonder. These are the people who are our leaders. MashaAllah tabarakallah. You had to know that that was gonna come out, man. You you had you had to, you know you had to know that was gonna come out. Abdul Razak as well. You know what I mean? Like some people, like you, you try to hold your tongue back. But you know what I'm saying? Like when you jump out there, you just like, yo, dude. And I mean, like, there's some other stuff. I mean, like, you know, let's not go there. You know what I mean? Like, I don't want to become like my enemies. You know what I mean? I don't want to, I don't want to do that. But if you're in a habit of exposing people, then you better make sure that your backyard is crisp, you know, spick and span. You better make sure that your backyard is spick and span before you jump up there and start exposing people. You best to sit down, keep your mouth shut, and just hope that none of that stuff come back to you. You understand? <laughs> you just hoping that none of that stuff come back to me. But you making dua, you telling people to make dua that you, you to make dua that they have sex with a jinn? What type of sexual deviant are you? I might be a deviant in terms of my Aqidah and all that other stuff, but you a social sexual deviant. You're a sexual deviant. <laughs> but Mustafa George, did you issue a statement when that was said about Abdul Wali? You issued a statement about me the very next day. Did you issue a statement? <laughs> anyway. So, not only that, Mustafa George went on to, he went on Twitter, and he posted a picture on Twitter of a, a book from a scholar called A Hadith al Nabawiya Fi Dham Al Ansuriya Al Jahiliya. Prophetic Hadith in Condemnation of Racism, Pre Islamic Racism. And he said that the Sheikh said, spread this in the West. <laughs> Yet he lives in Saudi Arabia where people who look like him are treated like second, third class citizens. How in the world are you, how in the world does a Sheikh tell you to spread this book in the West? Prophetic ahadith and condemnation of pre-Islamic racism. And you live in one of the most racist countries in the world. You live in Saudi Arabia, a place that advertises white-only English teachers. Yeah. Companies in Saudi Arabia who will not, only, will not hire as English teachers, English ESL, English instructors, unless they white. You understand? <laughs> they don't want African American And even if they hire you as an African American English teacher, guess what they pay you? They pay you way lower than they would pay a white English teacher, English instructor, even if he's a non-Muslim, simply on the basis that he's Caucasian. You understand? He has less qualifications, less credentials, and it feeds into our age-old narrative that African Americans got to work twice as hard as everybody else only to get half of the recognition. You understand? We, we got to work twice as hard. You got a master's degree. And then you get a Caucasian that come with a bachelor's degree and a TESOL, right, certificate online. And they pay him, you know, 15,000 reals a month and they pay you eight, nine thousand. Simply on the basis that you're African-American. You understand? Crazy. And then you have the audacity to post a book on Twitter talking about somebody screenshot it and sent it to me. Shadi Muhammad, you need to take a look at this. <laughs> I'm racist now, right? So now we're going to just throw everything on him, right? MashaAllah, Tabarakallah. 
right? But you live in Saudi Arabia with people who look like you, right? People who look like you are, are non-factors. They don't care about you or, you know, people that look like you in Saudi Arabia are slaves. Understand? People who look like me and look like Mustafa George in Saudi Arabia are slaves. These are your maids. These are your car washers. These are your odd jobs. You understand? So, that that's you know that's that's that issue, man. So I mean, you can you can kind of see what's going on here, man. Right, abd. Right, they call you slave. They call you slave to your face. Right. In Saudi Arabia, but yet you telling the Sheikh telling you to, and I don't even think the Sheikh told you that. But nonetheless, you said the Sheikh told you to spread this book in the West. <laughs> spread this book in the West. Prophetic Hadith con condemning pre-Islamic racism. <laughs> the Sheikh told you to spread that in America. I've seen more racism in Saudi Arabia than I have ever experienced in America, and I've been in America all my life. I've been in Saudi Arabia for eight years of my life. I've seen more racism in Saudi Arabia the first year I was there. <laughs> you understand? I guess you want Dalil from the Quran and Sunnah for that too, that there's racism in Saudi Arabia. What's your Dalil? And then the best that you can do is post this book and attack the honor of brothers who, you know, in addition to being African-American, constantly, you know, consciously make a choice to tackle issues that are related to their people. Mustafa George, you either have or you suffer from an identity conflict. You are suffering from an identity conflict that is, suggest is suggestive of your irrelevance as a student of knowledge. Because if you are going to engage these communities here in America and you're not going to deal with issues that are directly related to them, then you're, you're irrelevant. You're irrelevant. All right. So as we move on, uh, Mustafa George, you get fatwas. This is the thing with fatwas. Now that we're on here, because we're going to go into scholarly endorsement. You get fatwas. These guys, they translate and transport fatwas from Saudi Arabia to America. All right. The job as a student of knowledge is to take the knowledge that you learned and to come here your people, study your people, do research, go back and consult with some of the scholars about your research, go back and do some, you know, clean it up, and then present that to your people. That's your job. Not translating and transporting fatwas that in many instances might be antiquated and may not even be applicable to the environment that you live in. Evidenced by some of the nonsense dealing with marriage that stem from translations of fatwas that have been, that have been translated. Like the fatwa from Sheikh bin Baz Ta'ala that was translated by them with the marriage with the intention of divorce. Sheikh bin Baz gave that fatwa to a particular individual. They took the fatwa, translated it, and pushed it out into our communities, into African American communities. Because ain't nobody else buying that marrying my daughter with the intention of divorcing her. No other community buying that. Not the Indo-Pak community, not the Arab community, not any other community. Ain't nobody letting you marry their daughter or their niece or their sister or their mother. Marry her with the intention of divorce her. Meaning, I'm going to marry her. It's muta without telling the person that they're going to be divorced. Sheikh Salih Fouzan, he said, even if Sheikh bin Baz gave this fatwa, with Sheikh Salih Fouzan said, Sheikh, Sheikh bin Baz, when it was brought to his attention that people were abusing this fatwa, he took it back. He retracted the fatwa. They didn't tell you that either. But they translated and transported the fatwa and pushed it into predominantly African-American communities. So you have many of our daughters, many of our sisters, many of our mothers who were victims of being married with the intention of divorce. And let me show you what that looks like. That's me having to sit down with a woman. And in my mind, I don't really want to be married to her for a long period of time. I just want to have sex, allow sex, and then I'm out. But I don't tell her that. I make her believe that we're going to spend the rest of our lives together. And we're going to Jannah together. And then I feed her all of this narrative about us going to Jannah together and fearing Allah together. And then we get married. And then three days after we get married, I decide, you know what, I'm out. 
and I leave. Yeah, many of the brothers from the UK, right? Many of the brothers from the UK, Salafi Publications and Company, you came to Masjid Rahmah conferences here in America, you married sisters in our communities, and then you went back to Birmingham, you went back to the UK, and you left these women here divorced. You understand? Women reaching out to Shadi Muhammad, am I still married? I married the brother from the UK. And then after the conference was over, I don't know where he is. I said, sister, you're divorced. He went back to the UK. They have this thing called marriage with the intention of divorce. Now that's not misyad, misyad is something else. Misyad is when two people agree that this is gonna be the setup. This woman marries into it, believing that she's gonna be this man's wife and that they're gonna to go to Jannah together. You understand? This is not misyad, it's haram. Sheikh Salih Fozan said it's haram. Even if Sheikh Bin Baz gave the fatwa, it's haram. But where are these fatwas being pushed? In the African American community. These brothers, Wallah al if these brothers are imams of your communities, then you need to work towards removing them from being the imams of your communities. If you're saying for real, Ahi, then you probably need to go back to sleep. This is real talk. I didn't, I'm not sitting here wasting my time, man. I, you think I'm sitting here sweating, sitting here talking, losing my voice as I keep talking I'm, and making this stuff up? You got to be kidding me, man. Real talk. It's not even muta marriage because at least in muta, it's an agreement. You and the woman say, we're going to be married for six months. Once the six month period is over with, we're done. That's muta. It's an agreement between you and the woman. Similar to Miss Yah. Marriage with the intention of divorce is you have the intention to divorce her. You don't disclose that to her. You make her believe that you and her are going to ride off into the sunset and be married. Yeah. Right. And I translated a plethora of articles, you know, refuting that on Medina.com. And this is when Shadid Muhammad started to become a problem because you're countering, right, this narrative that keeps African-American Muslims in this place where they at. So these brothers, they get fetwas and they translate and transport these fetwas from Saudi Arabia to America not just to America, to African-American Muslim communities to further marginalize us and to keep us functioning at a very low level of consciousness while propping up unlearned individuals. Um, Periscope, you about to be mad at me because this is about to die. <laughs> Can we plug that in somewhere? If you're on Periscope, you can go to my Facebook page and tune into Facebook Live because Periscope getting ready to cut off, man. <laughs> Sorry about that. These iPhones, man. Battery life, very shallow, unfortunately. Good. Okay. Um, so that's one thing. We transport, translate, and transport, right, these fetwas into the African American communities. I want to show you their agenda. I'm going to show you their agenda. And while you're translating these type of fetwas and pushing them into the African American community, this constantly keeps us dysfunctional, right? Constantly keeps us dysfunctional. Let me give you another one so we can, uh, we can be clear about this. Mustafa George himself translated an article regarding the impermissibility of women going to college in America. And he said that Muslim women, it's haram to go to college. This is Mustafa George. For all of you up in Riyadh who held Mustafa George to be the sheikh of Riyadh, you ought to be ashamed of yourselves. It says a lot about you. It says a lot about you. He translated an article that says that women, it is haram for women in America, in the West, not just America, in the West, right, to go to college. 
Meanwhile, many of the scholars in Saudi Arabia have sent their children here to America to go to college. <laughs> So here you are in America, and mind you, the only people who feed into this is who? African-American Muslims. Because Arab community, they all go to college. Indo-Pak community, they all go to college. They're all doctors and you know physicians anyway. So they got to go to college, right? The only people who buy into this narrative are African-Americans. They've been pushing this stuff for years. It is haram to go to college. When you come into an environment like the African-American slums of Philadelphia, New Jersey, North New Jersey, New York, and you tell these brothers and sisters that they can't go to college, it is haram. You didn't say they can't. You didn't say it's been babi ola. You didn't say that it's uh, probably not a good thing to do. You said it's haram. Listen to the wording. It is haram to go to college. And Mustafa George said that it's haram for women to go to college because they teach Darwinism in college. And you're saying to yourself, first of all, dude, the only reason why you got a, a degree from any university is the Islamic University of Medina. And be, to be honest with you, the, on, the, the Islamic University in Medina saved a lot of you Negroes. Because other than the Islamic University of Medina, most of us wouldn't even have a degree. And that includes myself. I don't even know if I would have gone to college had I not got the opportunity to go to Islamic University of Medina. You understand? Most of us would have never even went to college. Had it not been, we would have been some bum losers selling oils, doing working odd jobs just like everybody else. The only thing that saved our lives is the Islamic University of Medina. And then you get your degree, you sit on your degree, you got hired at the school that you teach in in Riyadh because you have a degree. And then you sit from this place of privilege and tell poor African American Muslims in America that it's haram to go to college. Tell me that's not an agenda. You tell me that that's not an agenda. Brothers and sisters, look at the bigger picture here, man. This ain't about what is halal and haram and staying away from what is halal and haram. This is to keep you dysfunctional, to keep you functioning at a low frequency, to keep you off balance, to keep you struggling, to keep you where you are while the rest of the hegemony, the rest of the world continues to advance and move forward. So while other communities are getting married and having children and they work good jobs and they have college degrees, the African-American Salafi communities, is, we're still arguing about whether it's permissible to go to college. <laughs> I mean, go figure. We're still arguing about whether or not it's permissible to go to college. SubhanAllah. We, we, need, we need to reclaim our communities. We need to reclaim our communities. I am not going to stop until you look at these brothers like the people that they should have been looked at from the very beginning. And I mean, it is what it is. These are facts, man. Why are we dumb enough to believe it? Because we put trust and hope in these individuals. We believe that everything that they're telling us because it's coming from the shake. Because many of us come from Christianity, so we have this Jesus save mentality. We still attach to personality. And that's another thing. When people convert to Islam, we don't do enough, you know, tezki and tarbiya. We don't do, we don't do enough tahliya with tahliya. Removing the filth and replacing it with that which is better. We don't do any of that. They convert to Islam, pull your pants up above your ankles, grow your beard, get your prostration mark in the masjid five times a day, selling oils, and you all in. That's it. Standards are so low. And the moment you pull up in front of the masjid with a nice car, you too much into the dunya. The moment they find out you're going to college, it's haram for you to go to college. The moment they find out you got money, brothers, you got to give sadaqah. Hey, brother, you know, we got this imam coming, right? Abu Sayyid, we got this brother coming. Can we borrow your car? How are you asking this brother to borrow his car? How are you asking this brother? One man in the community, you find out he got a little bit of paper. Oh, can, you, can, you, we, can we borrow money from you so we can pay this imam from coming to the community? This is how we do. You, got, you look like you got a little bit of money. We're going we gonna to usurp. We're going to take advantage of you completely. You look like you come from, you know, good flock, good family. 
We're going to stay around you until we can absorb, until we can suck you dry. That's the Islamic community. Right, selling turtles and selling oils. I mean, come on, man. Come on, man. And, that's, and as long as we're doing that, we're on par. We, we're, we're Salafi, we're doing good. <laughs> the Dawah is spreading. <laughs> but the moment you step away from that and you say, nah, I need to get my life together. I'm going to college. I'm going to get a good job. I'm going to take care of my family. Brother, we don't see you at the mass shit no more. Oh, brother, we see your pants but no your ankles, brother. Brother, we see you trimmed your beard, brother. Brother, we see you talking to his beast. And then you go from all of that to now... You're a hisby. You go in the masjid now, get the salams, brother don't even give you salams no more. You're like, well, damn, well, what did I do? What did I do? Because I started doing better for myself. Because I started not accepting everything you told me. <laughs> right? When you come and you say, well, you know, you know, the sheikh did issue a fatwa saying, you know, that that was haram. And you're like, yeah, alhamdulillah, shukran for that. And we see you the next day that you didn't adhere to it. Oh, now it's a problem. Because I gave you the Dalil and you didn't follow it. So now we want to start superimposing on you our views. and You know what I mean? Just to keep you as a low life with nothing. It's a, a bigger agenda here, man. We translated, you, you translated and transported fatwas about praying in the masjid of Ahlul Bidah. And you left that open, Ahlul Bidah, to Ali Davis, Jazakallahu Khairan who came and did a, cl a few classes explaining what actually bid'ah is. Because they never actually explain to you what bid'ah is. They just tell you, the sheikh said, stay away from the masjids of Ahlul Bid'ah. And you say, okay. So now, who is Ahlul Bid'ah? They get to interpret who Ahlul Bid'ah is. Whoever they tell you Ahlul Bid'ah is, that's who Ahlul Bid'ah is. And if they really want to get you know, they really want to bring it, they'll go to the sheikh and get a fatwa. Sheikh, there's a masjid in our community. The imam of the masjid is known to be an ikhwani. <laughs> this guy doesn't... African American. What, what in the world do we know about being an ikhwani? <laughs> call me Nation of Islam or call me part of the War of Dean community. Ikhwani? <laughs> I don't know anybody who calls himself an ikhwani. <laughs> I live in a predominantly African-American neighborhood. I don't know one Muslim who calls himself an Ikhwani. Please tell me. <laughs> Ikhwani? <laughs> really? <laughs> There's an imam in our community. Is a masjid, masjid such and such. And they make sure they throw the name out there. And the imam is an Ikhwani. And he calls to, you know, Irjah. He calls to and they bring up some fancy term. And the sheikh says, oh, he's a stray. He's a hisbi. Put, tell the people to stay away from Sheikh should we tell the people to stay away from them? Tell the people to stay away from them and only frequent the messages of Ahlul Sunnah. A Salafia. And then they translate that and they come back to the community and they say, your imam is astray. The Sheikh just warned against the masjid. <laughs> right? This is the blueprint. The Sheikh just warned against the masjid. The imam is astray. The Sheikh said it right here. And so the same Sheikh who gave you Shahada taught you how to make wudu, taught you how to pray, taught you how to communicate. Wallah al if an imam taught you how to pray, the imam told you how to talk to God. You understand? If an imam taught you how to make wudu and taught you how to pray, the imam taught you how to communicate with God in the way that God legislated it. How in the world could you ever turn your back on somebody like that? How in the world could you ever, I don't care if he is a stray, there's still a part of you that, you know, that is merciful and compassionate. This person taught me how to pray. This person taught me how to communicate with Allah when I was a stray. I didn't even know how to pray. I didn't even know how to properly communicate with Allah. This person taught me to take beer, Allahu Akbar. Taught me how to make sujood twice. Taught me how to recite Al-Fatiha. And lo and behold, I now know how to communicate with Allah. But the imam is astray. Well, he wasn't that astray. He taught you how to pray. <laughs> right? He wasn't that astray. He taught you how to pray. He taught you how to make wudu. You now know how to communicate with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. He wasn't that astray. But this is the blueprint. So now they get the, the fatwa. Oh, the sheikh said, stay away from the messages of Ahlul Bidah. 
Okay, well then who's Ahlul Bidah? They get to determine who Ahlul Bidah is. So they say, oh, this masjid is the masjid of Ahlul Bidah. So well, what's wrong with the masjid? Oh, the imam is the ikhwani. And they never explain to you what an ikhwani is. <laughs> they say, oh, he's a follower of Hassan al-Banna from the ikhwan and muslimi Okay, but you still didn't explain to me what an ikhwani is. I still don't know what their belief system is. Still don't know what they believe. Oh, they revolt against the governments. Okay, but why? You still haven't told me why. What is the core beliefs of the ikhwani that makes my imam an ikhwani? That I have to take what you said. They'll never go that deep with you. The deeper you go with them, the more shallow you see that they are. You understand? The deeper you go with them, the more shallow you see that they are. The more you realize they don't even have a clue what the hell they're talking about. And so while you did all of this, Mustafa George and Salafi publications and company, you have kept, you have managed to keep African American Muslim communities at this place, right, of dysfunction for so many years. But the, the you know, the trick is out of the bag now. We, we figured it out. Alhamdulillah. We figured it out. And what we need to start doing is starting to create you know, a system that works for us it may not work for everybody, but it has to work for us and our communities, man. All right. So not only do we transport, translate and transport fatwas, we also get you also get endorsements from scholars. We also get endorsed. You also get endorsements from scholars. So now you have a great scholar like Sheikh Rabia Ibn Hadi al Madkhali who issues a statement saying that Abu Muhammad al-Maghribi is a mountain of knowledge. Alright, so here's the kicker. Uh, spoiler alert. Abu Muhammad al-Maghribi has never studied anywhere. Abu Muhammad al-Maghribi came to America, he used to deliver pizzas. Abu Muhammad al-Maghribi used to deliver pizzas, he had no beard. And he used to deliver pizzas and play soccer. He came to America to play soccer. This is what he told me. This is not me making this up. This is what Ridwan told me. That's his real name. All of a sudden, he gets dawa from African American Salafis. He comes into the masjid, grows his beard, and because he knows English and he knows Arabic, he starts to translate. This is how his career started. Abu Wais rahimahullah ta'ala said that Abu Muhammad should never be a student of knowledge because he's not a student of knowledge. The only thing Abu Muhammad can do is translate. Master Rahma, you know better than that. Master Rahma, you know Abu Wais rahimahullah ta'ala told you guys that Abu Muhammad is not a student of knowledge. Do not let him do anything but translate. And that's one of the things I love about Abu Awais rahimahullah ta'ala, straight shooter, straight shooter, he don't cut no corners. But he told Masjid Rahmah, do not let Abu Muhammad give any lectures, he is not a student of knowledge, he is not learned. The only thing that he can do is translate. And that's all he ever did, was translate. Even when he became the Imam of Masjid Rahmah, all he did was translate. But Sheikh Rabia referred to him as a mountain of knowledge. <laughs> what any, I mean, like even graduates from the Islamic University never even got an endorsement like that. But why? The question is now, why? Why would a scholar like Sheikh Rabia, who Abu Muhammad never even studied with him, <laughs> to call him a mountain of knowledge? Why would Sheikh Rabia refer to Abu Muhammad al Maghribi, Ridwan? Why would he refer to this brother as a mountain of knowledge? Why? Because he's going to continue the agenda. You understand? You, are you guys connecting the dots now? Abu Muhammad al Maghribi is going to continue the agenda. Which is why when I graduated, he had to make sure that 
Whatever Sheikh Ubay said about me stuck. Master Rahma paid for me to go make Umrah because Master Rahma wanted me to rectify my issue because they saw value in what I brought to the community, which is where I'm from. That's my community. And they wanted to help me rectify that situation. But Abu Muhammad couldn't have that because the fear was that if Shadi Muhammad rectifies his affair with Sheikh Ubaid and Sheikh Rabia, then I'm out of a job. Because I had just graduated. And so the fear, even when he came to make Umrah, I graduated in 2007. I graduated in 2007. Abu Muhammad al Maghribi came with Masjid Rahma in 2006. Uh, 2007. That they came to make Umrah in May. I graduated in July. They came in May like they usually did. And when they got to, the, to Medina, the first thing Abu Muhammad said, so you graduate in this year, right? I said, yeah. He said, well, yeah, they're probably going to make you the imam of Masjid Rahma. I said, no, nah, I don't want to be the imam. I don't want to be the imam. So that just lets you know his insecurity right then and there. He knew. He knew that his, his life, his window was very short at that point. So when everything jumped off with Shadi Muhammad going to the movies and I'm saying that the Sahaba different than Aqidah, he capitalized off of that. He had to capitalize off of that because his job was on the line. You understand? So even when I went over and I met with Sheikh Rabia, he sent Ashraf to go spy on the conversation to bring back the narrative and he could twist the narrative to be whatever he wanted to be. When we got back to America, we went to Masjid Rahma. I, myself, and the board of Masjid Rahma, Abdul Karim, uh, Tajuddin, all of the board members that were there, right? We were under the impression that Sheikh, Sheikh Rubiya said, you know, go back and give da'wah. Were we not? Abu Muhammad spent it. So when we got in to the masjid, the community, member, the community members are obviously like, well, what happened with Shadi? Did the Shadi straighten out the situation with the Sheikh? And what does Abu Muhammad do? He grabs the microphone and he stands in front of the community and say, no, Sheikh Rubiya did not rectify Shadi Muhammad's affairs. And as it, as it still stands, Sheikh, uh, uh, the Sheikh said that he shouldn't be given da'wah. Wallahi, I kid you not. <laughs> Why? Because we got to keep this narrative going. We go in the office. And I said, is that what you understood? I said, you wasn't even at the meeting. He said, yeah, but Ashraf brought me the narration back. I said, but Ashraf lied to you. <laughs> That's not the way the meeting went. I and... Other students of knowledge were there in the room, and that's not what he said. So he said, well, you know, I can't, you know, I'm, I'm not going to get involved. I said, so regardless of what's being said, you're going to go with that instead of going with what is correct. Abu Muhammad looked me in my face, and he said to me, I'm with the scholars. He said, Shadid, you know, may Allah, you know, keep you firm. And he stuck his hand out. I smacked his hand. Get your hand out my face. I wouldn't dare touch your hand. This will come back to all of y'all. The board members of Masjid Rahma are sitting there in the office like, what in the world just happened? But Abu Muhammad had to secure his job. You know, paying $1,700 a month for somebody's, you know, house. You know, not too many people going to get that up. You understand what I'm saying? When you come from nothing, right? You come from nothing. You understand? Abu Muhammad comes from nothing. Didn't have a corporate job. He wasn't working in corporate America. You was a pizza delivery guy. And you went from being a pizza delivery guy to translating to being now the imam of one of the most prominent Salafi masjids in the African-American community. And I kid you not, for the time that he was the imam there and the people there can bear witness to that, he didn't empower the people one bit. Didn't increase your knowledge of anything. You understand? He didn't increase your knowledge in anything. He didn't advance the things that were of interest to African Americans. And then he resigned as a sign of his allegiance and loyalty to Salafi publications and the scholars and moved to Atlanta. And then that's when the Caucasian Imam Umar Quinn came in. And here again, another three, four, five years of nothing. <laughs> of nothing. So you went from Abu Muhammad to Umar Quinn to now nothing. And the people that could have benefited you, like Tahir Wyatt, 
who you flipped on, who Tar Hair took you guys overseas every year and introduced you to all of the scholars that he knew. Masjid Rahma had no connection to the scholars until Tar Hair made the connection for you. You had no connections and you flipped the script on Tar Hair who has been there for you guys from day one. I know you regret it now. I know you regret it now. You flipped the script on Tar Hair. You put pressure on Tar Hair to write a refutation on Abu Hassan and Ma'rabi because Sheikh Rabia wanted you guys to get Tar Hair to put a refutation out, out, out on Abu Hassan and Ma'rabi. Tar Hair said, I'm not writing anything. He went to Sheikh Sali Suhaimi, so all the Sheikh Sali Suhaimi said, Tar Hair, you better not write anything. Let Sheikh Rabia say whatever you're going to say. Understand? That's how it went down. Abu Ramesa, you need to make Toba. You need to fear Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and repent. The pressure that you put on Tar here to write that refutation on Abu Hassan al Ma'rabi so you could save the enterprise of Masjid Rahmah. You didn't care about Tar here's reputation. You didn't care about the fact that if you, even if he wrote a refutation on Abu Hassan al Ma'rabi, it would be a lie. Because he doesn't take from Abu Hassan al Ma'rabi. He's not a companion or friend or a student of Abu Hassan al Ma'rabi. You knew that. Tahir took you guys overseas and introduced you to every Salafi scholar he knew. And you pressed him to write a refutation on Abu Hassan al Ma'rabi. You guys ought to be ashamed of yourselves. Nights he stood up translating for the Sheikh for you guys. Nights. That we rented vehicles, vans, driving y'all all around uh, Medina. How dare you do that? All for what? So you can save the enterprise of Masjid Rahma over top of Chicken Shack? That's the best that you can offer to the African American Muslim community? You gotta be kidding me, man. And you pressured me. To write the refutation on Medina.com so that I could be a part of your, of, of your summer conference. Because you know that most of the, many of the people that came to your Master Rahman conference was coming to listen to me. That's not me dinging my own bell. That's me telling you facts. You pressured me to write the refutation on Medina.com because you wanted me a part of your program. So that you can get more people coming out because that's how y'all made your money. Facts. Take facts. So, all of this is leading up to the agenda of Salafi publications. Agenda of Salafi publications. And they're behind all of this. And if you notice that all of these loose fatwas, Abu Muhammad al Maghribi is a mountain of knowledge, Abu Khadija, mashallah, Sheikh Ubay told people to make hijrah. Make hijra, migrate to Birmingham to take knowledge from Abu Khadija and Amjad Rafiq. <laughs> my sister knew a wife, uh, a sister, my wife knew a sister who said when, Sheikh, when they translated that fatwa and put it out, or they translated that comment of Sheikh Ubey and put it out, my wife knew a sister, hardcore Salafi sister, who said she was packing her stuff. And was moving from New Jersey to Birmingham to study under Abu Khadija. And if it wasn't for the fact that I, I'm merciful, girl, I will call your name out. <laughs> you ought to be ashamed of yourself too. You told my wife you was going to pack your bags <laughs> and move to Birmingham. My wife is like, girl, have you lost all of your marbles? <laughs> She said, but Sheikh Ubey said, we need to make hijra. <laughs> Sheikh Ubey said, make hijra to Birmingham and study under Abu Khadija. Who Abu Khadija have never studied under anybody. Amjad Rafiq, who is a biochemist, never studied Islamic knowledge under anybody. And you are going to make hijra to go study and go be with the Salafis who have connections to the scholars. That's all they got. It's connections to some scholars. Because the scholars that they, you know, 
don't want to have connections with, you know why. <laughs> why you don't have no connection with Sheikh Salih Suhaimi? Why you don't have any connection to Ibrahim Ruhaili? Why you don't have any connection to uh, Sheikh Wasiullah Abbas? Uh, you hate the way Sheikh Wasiullah Abbas. And this is the thing that you guys need to understand with Sheikh Wasiullah Abbas. Sheikh Wasiullah Abbas is a Bengali. He's Bangladeshi. And we know how Pakistanis feel about Bangladeshis. <laughs> you understand? So who is Sheikh Wasiullah Abbas? Right? Who is Sheikh Wasiullah Abbas to speak about Abu Khadija? Who is a Kashmiri Pakistani? So you got to understand, you know, the, the power, you got to understand the dynamics that are at play here. Because Abu Khadija would have never said the things that he said about Sheikh Wasiullah. He would have never said that about Sheikh Salih Suhaimi. And Sheikh Salih Suhaimi said the same thing about Abu Khadija that Sheikh Wasiullah Abbas said about Abu Khadija. But you would refute Sheikh Wasiullah Abbas, but you wouldn't say a word about Sheikh Salih Suhaimi. And you know why. <laughs> that got that cultural thing going on. You understand? So, I mean, you know, these are the type of people that we have. These are the type of people that we have. I'm not done yet. Um, so let's, let's talk about some solutions here. So we've lost about two generations of our children. Nobody else has lost their children. Everybody got their children close at home. Meanwhile, African-American, we two generations of our kids going out in the world, getting high, tattooed up, clubbing, and, you know, doing them. We, we lost our children to this nonsense. We lost our children to this nonsense. Nobody else lost their children. So now, <clears throat> two or three generations of our children are gone to these individuals. I blame them. Part, we are part responsible for that, but I blame them. Not anymore. We're about to fix this problem. Sorry, not sorry, but it has been 20 years since this campaign started. And since then, we've had no progress, and I think it's clear what is in the way of our progress as a community. Wouldn't you guys understand from all of this? Wouldn't you see what is in the way of our progress as a people, as Muslims, American Muslims in these communities? We see who is in the way of our progress. We see who is in the way of our progress. So... Although we see who is progressing, Salafi publications, their six-figure empire, without a doubt, has profited. <laughs> You've profited. Six figures, man. You, you, you're doing your numbers. But you were doing your numbers off the back of our communities. So, from this point forward, you're not doing your numbers off our communities anymore. Stop buying Salafi publications books. Stop putting money into their pocket which does not come back to your communities and that just makes all the sense in the world why are you going to constantly keep putting money into the pocket of someone who keeps you who keep telling you college is haram who keep telling you to take from the same three or four selfie scholars and your communities have not advanced in 20 years what have what have they done in 20 years and you still keep putting money in their pockets. You still keep going out to the bookstore, Salafi bookstores, buying Salafi publications books. Facts. You're still going out buying their books. Stop buying their books. Now, they might get offended. They might not have been offended with nothing else I said. But now when I start talking about their business, oh, we got a problem now. Because I'm, I'm cutting your money short. And I'm telling you, brothers and sisters, if you keep putting money in the pocket of your oppressor, then you will deserve to be oppressed. I wouldn't care if you translated a book. I wouldn't care if you translated a book that was actually related to a subject that I consider dear. I wouldn't spend a dime on you. I wouldn't give a dime because ain't none of that coming back to my community. None of that coming back to my community. None of this money that you are spending on Salafi publications is coming back to your community. But yet, the moment they advertise for a new book that they published, 
Salafi book that they publish, you run right out to the bookstore and you go purchase it, putting money in their pocket. While they study telling you you can't go to you can't go to college. <laughs> you can't go to college. <laughs> They're marginalizing you, but you still putting money in their pockets. Classic African Americans, man. Right. So Salafi Publications is basically the Wizard of Oz. Right? You've seen the movie The Wizard of Oz, right? And Oz was this small little guy that's hiding behind this big voice. He sounds really scary, right? But when you remove the curtain, here's just this small little guy that nobody should really be afraid of. And that is what Salafi publications represent today. We've removed the, the curtain, as we used to say in Jahiliya, pull your skirt up, see everybody, see, see you for who you are and what you are. Remove the curtain, we can now see that Salafi Publications is just uh, Bilal Davis. He's not even part of Salafi. He's, not, he's just, they just use him for the greater good. He takes one for the team. But Salafi Publications, make no mistake about it, is Amjad Rafiq and Abu Khadija um, Wahid Alam. That is Salafi Publications. And everybody else that got their hand in there are just flunkies that they use to push their agenda. And the sad thing about it is that all of the people that are pushing their agenda, they don't have anything to do with your agenda. All right, so let's, let's talk about how we're going to build these communities and rebuild these communities. All right, so after this 20-year campaign, we have come to the realization that um, it's time to reclaim our communities and begin laying down um, some things that will help you know uh, we have to stop importing um, you know uh, Salafi brand or uh, foreign or cultural brands of Islam into our community stop importing this stuff stop importing foreign interpretations of Islam into our communities when we bring information from the scholars we look at that in terms of what is applicable to our environments and what is not applicable to our environments. Number two, we have to start revering and respecting our scholars. Our shuyukh. Yes, Salafi scholars may not consider them to be shuyukh and we don't expect them to. Tahir is a scholar. In my eyes, he's a scholar. Some of the scholars call him a scholar. And I'm cool with that. You don't have to accept him as a scholar. But the fact of the matter is that you take from Abu Khadija, who didn't study anywhere, and might only have a high school diploma, and there's others who will listen to Sheikh Tahir Wyatt, who actually has a PhD in Islamic studies. <laughs> Mufti Munir, who has a master's degree in the sciences of hadith. I consider him a scholar. They don't necessarily have to be mutabahr. They don't have to be scholars that have knowledge of all matters of the religion, but in their own circle of competency, they are scholars. Muhammad Munir, I consider him a scholar, without a doubt, hands down. And I would put him up against any Salafi, whoever, student of knowledge, graduate, non-graduate, I would put him up against any one of you. Education matters, absolutely. <laughs> absolutely. Ali Davis is on on that way. Graduate from the Islamic, uh, uh, graduate from Umm Qura University with a degree in Sharia. Abu Sajid Saeed graduated from Umm Qura University. I'm calling out to you, students of real students of knowledge. And here I go again endorsing people. And then five years from now, somebody turn around and warn against me. <laughs> And the saga continues, man. But I don't know anything else, man. That's, uh, you know what I mean? Like, these are the people that I would consider, you know, you know, you know these are people of knowledge, man. Imam Fahim Lee, Imam Akil Ingram. These are Imams in our communities. These are Imams. They don't necessarily have to be right about everything that they say. We're going to make mistakes. Mistakes is part of our narrative, that's how we grow. We're going to make mistakes. That's part of how we grow. 
This is part of how we develop. How does any person develop into being better except that they have to make mistakes along the way? That's part of our narrative. Stop saying, oh, the brother got mistakes. <laughs> what the heck does that mean? Oh, the brother made some mistakes. So what? So what? How is he going to get better except that he has to make mistakes? That's part of the narrative. Look into the life of any scholar of Islam. Choose one. Pick one. And I'll show you a scholar who along his journey of seeking knowledge, along his journey, he has made mistakes. Shaykh Al-Taymin, rahimahullah ta'ala, before he died, there was a time as Shaykh Abdullah Bukhari, who was one of his students, told me, told us personally, there was a time when Shaykh Al-Taymin had about four students. Everybody left the Shaykh because he made some comments that people interpreted in terms of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala being everywhere. And people capitalize off of that and begin chasing people away from Muhammad ibn Salih al-Uthaymin, the same, same shape that we held as a Salafi scholar of all Salafi scholars. Yeah, right before he died, he had four students. And Shaykh Abdullah Bukhari was one of them. Everybody makes mistakes. That's part of our narrative, man. That's how we become better. But you correct with hifth al protecting and preserving the person's honor, preserving his status and his position, regardless, even if it's a mistaken aqidah. Even if it's a mistaken aqidah, he didn't intentionally make the mistake. He made ijtihad, he looked into the adilla, and this is what he came out with. And if you consider that to be wrong, then you have to go to the person and say, hey, listen, make munakasha. we have a debate, a scholarly debate. And obviously the person that's going to go to the person and, and debate them is another person of knowledge. How you have a student of knowledge who graduated from a prestigious university with a degree and you got a layman who somebody put a battery in his back who will come up to you and say, I want to debate with you about... Man, go sit down somewhere, man. I wouldn't dignify you with a response. Go sit down somewhere. And he said, oh, he's arrogant. He don't, I don't see you as a, as a person of knowledge that I got to debate with you. Bring me somebody of knowledge. Imam Ahmed, rahimahullah ta'ala, when he was in prison for not saying that the Quran was created and Ibn Abi Du'ad... He kept saying, why don't you debate with me? They, uh, you know, the, the imam of that or the leader of the Muslims during that time, he would bring scholars in to debate with Imam Ahmed about the Quran being created. And Imam Ahmed would debate with this one, would debate with that one, would debate with that one. But Ibn Abi Du'ad, he would never debate with him. He would always ignore him. And then one day, Ibn Abi Du'ad, he came to Imam Ahmed and he said, why is it that you debate with this scholar, this one, this one, but you will never debate with me? And Imam Ahmed said, because you're not a scholar. <laughs> Bring me a scholar and I'll debate with a scholar. You're not a scholar. I'm not going to debate with you. You're nobody. You understand? But you get these brothers who got a battery in their back and they come up to you and they want to debate issues and you're just like, all right, so I'm going to come out. Uh, you know. Imam Shafi, rahimahullah ta'ala, he said, uh, مَا جَادَلَنِي جَاهِلٌ إِلَّا غَلَبَنِي وَمَا جَادَلْتُ عَالِمًا إِلَّا غَلَبْتُ he said, I never debated with an alim, with a scholar, except that I conquered him in the debate. And I never debated with someone who was an ignoramus, except he conquered me in the debate. Because you can't argue with somebody who's ignorant. You just say, you know what, brother? You're right. You're right. Okay. All right. Salaikum. And you leave. Because you can't argue with an ignoramus. Because they don't have any book. There's no the wabit. There's no guidelines. There's no nothing in his debating. He's going to argue with you what the Sheikh said, what Sheikh Uthaymin said, and Sheikh Albani said, and Sheikh Fulan said. I don't do arguments with the, the opinions of scholars. Who in the world does that? Can you even, is it even safe to call that a debate? Sheikh Rushay Dan, who was one of the top students of Sheikh Abdul Mahsan al abad he was my teacher, right, in my last year. He was a teacher of Hadith. And we had to write a bath, we had to write a research paper. Pick a subject. He gave us a list of topics that we had to choose from. And he said, in your thesis, in your essay, if I see the name of one contemporary scholar in your thesis, I'm going to rip it up. Don't bring me no debate with no contemporary scholar. Don't bring me no Sheikh al-Albani. Don't bring me no Sheikh al -Taymin. Don't bring me no Sheikh al -Rabiyya. Don't bring me no contemporary scholar. You guys are students of knowledge. You go in deep to the books and you go to Al-Ilm Al-Qadim, you go to that ancient knowledge. First, second, third generation of Islam. Al-Asr al dhahabiyya that golden era of Islam. You don't bring me, you know, arguing with the opinion of modern day scholars. And that's what these brothers do because they're not students of knowledge. So the first thing that we have to start, stop doing, stop importing 
uh, a foreign interpretation of Islam into our communities. That's number one. Number two, start revering and respecting, restore the respect back to African American imams, shuyukh, students of knowledge. If Abu Muhammad al Maghribi, who never studied nowhere, can be a mountain of knowledge, then Ali Davis can be a mountain of knowledge, who's a graduate with a degree from Umm al Qura University and the, the, the science of Sharia, Islamic law. You understand? If Abu Muhammad al Maghribi can be a, a mountain of knowledge and people moving from New Jersey to uh, Atlanta to go study with Abu Muhammad, then you should be migrating to Philadelphia to go study under Saeed and uh, Ali Davis. <laughs> I mean, come on, man. Restore back the respect to Abu Muslim. I mean, I, I have some reservations, but nonetheless, he's still one of our imams. He's still one of my, our imams, and I respect him and I love him dearly. Because some of the same stuff I'm saying right now, Abu Muslim said this stuff 20 years ago. And y'all said he was crazy. Abu Muslim said some of the same stuff 20 years ago. And we all looked at him like he was crazy. So it might be safe to say that he was before his time. He, it might be safe to say that Abu Muslim was actually before his time. Because some of the same stuff that you guys are cheering me on for right now, he was saying this stuff 20 years ago. Abu Muslim, absolutely. Okasha, absolutely. Sheikh, this talk, we're talking about a man, not just Hafiz Quran. Okasha is not just Hafiz Quran. Okasha is Hafiz Quran in many different dialects of the Quran. <laughs> many different dialects of the Quran. He didn't just memorize the Quran in Hafs and Asim. He memorized Warsh. He memorized this one. He memorized this one. You understand? He is a sheikh. You understand? He can quote the Bible verbatim, give you the paragraph, give you the number of the page. He has a photographic memory. You understand? Okasha. And he's not just versed in Quran. We're talking about a dude, his mutabaha. Dude is skilled in tafsir. Dude is skilled in fiqh. Dude is skilled in the history. He did a lecture on the Madahib al Arba. He ran down the names of the, the, each of the four Imams, their biography from memory. <laughs> memory. I've, I've, I haven't seen too many people in America, students of knowledge or otherwise, that is able to hold themselves like that. Hadith books. He can quote Hadith, memorize Hadith, give you the books off the top of his head. Yes, Okasha is a scholar. Absolutely. Okasha is a scholar, without a doubt. You have other imams, like Imam Rashid, who is the imam of Cherry Hill Masjid. You have uh, uh, Imam John Starlin, who's an imam, graduate from the Islamic University. Absolutely. Absolutely. Caucasian brother, and I love him dearly, but he don't get involved with a lot of Negro nonsense. My dude, absolutely. These are scholars, these are our shuyukh here in America. These are our shuyukh here in America. They may not be to the standards of Saudi Arabia. They may not be to the standards of this one or that one. But to us, these are our shuyukh. These are our imams. These are our imams. These brothers drag their families halfway across the world to go learn Islam. To come back and to teach usul al thalatha You got to be kidding me, man. And that's another issue that we need to get to. The communal stability that we need to establish. I'm talking to the students of knowledge now, including myself. There's a, a very famous quote by Marianne Williamson. She said, our deepest fear is not that we are inadequate. Our deepest fear is not that we are inadequate. Our deepest fear is that we are powerful beyond measure. Wallahi, I kid you not. I think our biggest fear is us. Our biggest fear is not that we are inadequate. Our biggest fear that we are powerful beyond measure. It is our light, not our darkness, that most frightens us. It is our light, not our darkness, that frightens us the most. Absolutely.
powerful. It is our light, not our darkness, that most frightens us. Your playing small does not serve the world. There's nothing enlightened about shrinking so that other people won't feel insecure around you. You understand? I'm talking about students of knowledge, imams, shuyuk, our shuyuk. Stop humbling yourself. Stop putting yourself down. Stop shrinking so that you don't make other people feel insecure. Our biggest fear is not that we are inferior. Our biggest fear is that we are powerful beyond measure. There's nothing enlightened about shrinking so that other people won't feel insecure around you. As we are liberated from our own fear, our presence automatically liberates others. As we are liberated from our own fear, our liberation, our presence automatically liberates others. I could not have thought of a quote that is more befitting of the students of knowledge in America right now. Brothers, man, we gotta, we gotta, we gotta step up. No longer, you know, I'm just a student of knowledge, I don't have any responsibility. No, 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 no. You are a leader in the African American Muslim community. You may be just a student of knowledge in every other community, but you serve a greater role in your own community. Understand that. So, we need to create think tanks amongst the students of knowledge. SOP. Do you know what SOP means? Does anybody know what this word SOP means? Standard operating procedures. And those things are laid down. We have to start being idadi. Idadi comes from the word idara. Idara means administration. And if you are a person that is idadi, that means that you think administratively. That's how you think. And this is what we're missing from our communities. We don't think administratively. We don't sit down and say, okay, we got this person here, this person here, this person here, and then put everybody to work based upon their competency. And let's work together. Work together to make it work for us. It may not work for somebody else, but it works for us. Think tanks. Students of knowledge haven't done any research because we're so busy with Salafi publications and company for the past 20 years. Standards of practice, excuse me, you're right. We have to create this in our communities and function by it. We have to create this and function by it. We have to create think tanks. We have to create research that is specific to our issues. Specific to our issues. Students of knowledge haven't really done any research in the past 20 years. What research have we done? What academic research papers have been done by students of knowledge who graduated from these universities? Probably none. Why? Because we've been so busy high in from selfie publications, high in from being warned against, afraid to connect with this student or that student because we don't want to be guilty by affiliation. You understand? Students of knowledge, man, we got to stop that, man. We got to stop that. All of that fear of being warned against, guess what? You already warned against, man. Even if they haven't mentioned your name already. Even if they haven't mentioned your name already, you already warned against. But we haven't done any research. We haven't laid down any curriculums. There's no curriculums. Islamic schools, even if we start off small with just pre-K to third grade, rent a small facility, we got brothers and sisters who got degrees in, you know, in education. That's not the problem. Creating schools for our children, renting a facility, purchasing a facility, remodeling, refurbishing the, the, the building to turn it into a pre-K all the way up to third grade. And then we can increase the grades as the years go by, as our needs increase. You understand? We got to start salvaging the, the youth. As Elijah Muhammad told Malcolm X, go after the young people and the older people will follow out of shame. 
I'm not concentrating my, my dawah efforts on you older brothers who got it all figured out. We're going after our youth. We're going after our children. Safeguarding them and preserving them and making sure that they have a better experience with Islam than we did. Creating curriculums that, are, that cater to our children. You, got, you go into these Muslim schools and the curriculums are good. But they don't cater to our children. You open the I Love Islam books, all of the characters in there are white. Your, your kid, African American, constantly flipping through the Islamic studies book and all they see is white faces. Where, when are we going to start catering to us? Education, curriculum, utilizing the resources that are in our communities. We have so many resources in our communities. Brothers and sisters have degrees in higher learning, higher uh, you know, matters of, of, of education that can become a critical component. You have Sister Nayila, Brother Hassan. You have Sister Aisha Prime. You have these, they are, they're, these, you have Dr. Brock, Raymond Brock. These are skilled professionals in the, in the matters of, uh, of marital counseling. These are marriage counselors. They don't necessarily need to be student of knowledge, but they're marriage counselors. You know, so this is what I wanted to present. There is no double, double jeopardy. <laughs> so even in, you know, even in this society that we live in, there is no double jeopardy. You can't charge a man with the same crime twice. So when you said Shadid Muhammad was a stray, he's a deviant, he's a kafir, he's an ikhwani, he's all these things, you already killed my character. There's nothing else that you can say about me. <laughs> there is no double jeopardy. You can't kill me twice. You already assassinated my character. <laughs> Bravo. <laughs> but how did that come back to you? And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is not done with you yet. You have harmed and hurt a lot of people. You have destroyed two generations of our communities. There's tons of sisters in our communities that are single mothers because of this Salafi, this person, this. And I'm not saying Salafi is not correct. The Quran and Sunnah. And the understanding of the righteous three, uh, three generations, I live by that. I die by that. I have never spoken about anything other than that. And the fact of the matter is that time has come for changes to be made. I'm not the game changer. I'm just laying down the facts for you. You can pick it up and you can connect the dots as you so please. But if we do not begin to take steps to create our own independence from this machine that has controlled us, controlled our communities, controlled our children, controlled the, narr the, the narrative of Islam. If we do not work to change that and be independent of that, 20 years will go by, I'll be dead and gone, and y'all still be sitting here talking about the same issues. And we pray that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala forgive us. We pray that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala bring our children back to Islam. Those of our children who have been chased away from this religion due to this harshness, due to this unnecessary roughness that unfortunately has been, you know, imported into our communities, you know, for reasons that I have already explained. We pray that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala forgives us, those of us who were unaware and were asleep. And we're not aware and unconscious and we played into this stuff, man. We pray that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala forgive us. We pray that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala allow us to make amends with the people that we've wronged. If you wrong people because you thought that you was on the Salafi path and you wrong people, you need to go back to those people and you need to rectify that. That, that is the point. You don't get to slide out of that. You don't get to say, oh, I'm not on that no more. Um, you know, I'm, I'm normal like everybody. No, 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 no. You wrong people. You harm people. And you need to go back to those people that you wronged, that you are people you severed ties with. Years you severed ties with and you need to make amends, man. Our communities need to heal. We need to heal, man. We hurting, we suffering as a community. While Salafi Publications is, you know, you're not hurting. They just came back from Hajj. You just got all your sins forgiven. You just made, you know, a couple, you know, couple tens of thousand dollars on your Hajj trip. To add to the hundreds of thousands of pounds that you've made for the year. And you ain't hurting for nothing. Our communities are hurting, man. We in pain, man. We in pain and that's why we keep 
inflicting pain on other people in our communities. Hurt people hurt people. And that's what we're doing to one another. And that needs to stop. Yeah, Shay. Shay, just to clarify for some of the viewers, right? are you promoting the idea that black brothers shouldn't be taking knowledge from white brothers and vice versa? The brother asked, am I promoting that African-American Muslims should only take knowledge from African-Americans? Absolutely not. Absolutely not. Rashid, who is the imam of Cherry Hill Masjid, he is Afghani. I love Rashid to death. We made hajj together. I love that brother. Sweetest brother that I have ever met. Uh, John Starling. Love this brother to death. They actually really do care about their communities. And so, no, I am not advocating that African-American Muslims only take from African-American imams, scholars, and things like that. That's not, that, they could be nothing further from the truth. SubhanAllah, now that you remind me, and I meant to apologize, there was a Caucasian brother who sent me a message on my Facebook page, and he might be listening now. And he said that he was in prison. And him and another Caucasian brother, they were in prison and they embraced Islam. And part of what they benefited in their embracing Islam was my biography that I wrote in the book, um, He Came to Perfect Moral Character. Brother Farouk Prost. I love Brother Farouk. Farouk was actually with me when I was at the meeting with Sheikh Rabia. Absolutely. I love Farouk. Funny dude. I love him to death. But to go back, the brother, he said that him and another Caucasian Muslim, they accepted Islam. And part of the reason that contributed to that was the fact that, um, that they read my biography. In the book, he came to perfect moral character. And they said that they could relate to a lot of it. <clears throat> and he said that some of the things that I said regarding white privilege, he said... That, that's not really for them. They don't really experience that. He said because as a Caucasian Muslim, he said they're always looked at as being the police. People are very untrusting of them when they come around in the community, especially African American communities. He said there are no Caucasian Muslim women converts in their com environment, so they are forced to marry women like African American women and other women from other cultures that they don't necessarily have a preference for. You understand? They don't necessarily have a preference for, but they have to because they want to get married. He says, so, you know, some of the things that I said, he said, you know, it, it pains him, even though he knows it's the truth. He said it pains him because it's not all true that some Caucasian converts come to Islam and do catch hell and do get it, do, do catch a bad rap. And I want to say, you know, for the sake of clarity that, you know, when I talked about white privilege, I'm not talking about all Caucasian converts to Islam. I'm not talking about all Caucasian converts to Islam. I was specifically referring to Musa Richardson and Umar Quinn, who are both Caucasian converts. And as the brother mentioned, there's a difference between taking knowledge from someone and being able to relate that knowledge to a level that is conducive to that person's culture. And I don't see, you know, Caucasian converts delving into cultural matters, cultural issues, like calling people racist, calling people nationalists. I don't see Farouk Post. I don't see John Starlin. I don't see Imam Rashid. I don't see any other Caucasian imam, or scholar, or da'i delving into those issues like that. Only those two. For, for some, you know, odd reason. Maybe because we gave them a pass. But we taking that pass back. You don't get that pass, man. We revoke your, your, your hood pass. You don't get that, man. So if you're going to speak about issues that are related to African Americans, speak about it with, you know, considering our culture, considering that like, we're not just nobody that you can just talk about us any type of way. And we don't matter. We don't care. You don't care about. No. When you speak about our issue, just like when we speak about anybody's issues, it should be done with respect. It should be done with respect, regardless of what the person's culture is. I don't, have to, I don't have a right to disrespect anybody because you're Bangladeshi. I don't have a right to disrespect anybody because you're Albanian. I don't have a right to disrespect you because you're Arab. I don't have a right to disrespect you or talk about your culture in a manner that is belittling to you. Anybody would feel offended by that. Anybody. Whether you're Trinidadian, whatever your culture is. 
Anybody would be offended if you're referring to a person's culture with disrespect. You understand? So, you know, when we, you know, and this is, you know, establishing those boundaries, those cultural boundaries. We're, mo we're not monolithic. We're not monolithic in terms of our culture. We're monolithic in terms of our belief in Tawheed and one God and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. But we're not monolithic in terms of the cultures that we come from. Even the Sahaba عنهم, took issue with other Sahaba that spoke about their culture. The Prophet ﷺ was in Medina and one Ansari hit another guy from the Muhajirin. And they begin to joke or whatever the case may be. And then the Ansar said, Ansar, stand up. And the other Sahabi said, Muhajirin, stand up. And the Prophet ﷺ said, I would die with Jahiliyyah. Wa ayna bayna adhurikum. Are you going to bring this pre-Islamic call to, you know, classism and racism while I'm standing right here? You understand? But they was offended. You don't get to offend my culture and then think that everything is sweet. No. Even if my culture is rooted in kufr. I'm a convert to Islam. So my culture is rooted in kufr. Yes. But that doesn't give you the right to disrespect them. And when we speak about our issues, we speak... Omar Quinn didn't study nowhere. He's Abu Uwais' brother-in-law. And that's the only privilege that he has in these communities. Period. He didn't study anywhere. He's Abu Uwais' brother-in-law. And that's the only credential that he has. The single most credential that he has is that he's Abu Uwais' brother-in-law. And so on the strength of Abu Uwais, rahimahullah ta'ala... He studied in Ohio at his house. You're absolutely right. The single most qualifying component that he has is that he's connected to our brother Abu Wais ta'ala through being married to someone from his family. That's it. That's it. Nothing else. And so with that, inshallah ta'ala, we'll conclude. I'm sorry I had to keep you guys so late. I pray inshallah ta'ala that there was some benefit in this. I pray that there was some benefit in this. And I pray that, you know, even if it doesn't change anything now, at least the conversation is there. We can't ignore the conversation. It's there, staring you right in your face. The conversation is staring you right in your face right now, and you can ignore it and continue as you have, right? Like you said in the Matrix, you can either take the blue pill, <laughs> right? And you can go to sleep and wake up and continue your day like nothing ever happened. Or you can take the red pill. And I'll show you how far the rabbit hole goes. Absolutely. Wa sallallahu ala nabiyyina Muhammad wa ala alihi wa sahbihi wa sallam taslimi kithira wa akhiru da'wana anilhamdulillahi rabbil alameen wa salamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.